In a harrowing moment, Reddit user Cherry Cranberries encountered a police officer who saved their life. But was it an officer or an angel? You decide. I was telling this story to someone today. I haven't spoken about this story in many years, but I thought I might share it. This happened about 10 years ago. I was barely 20 years old, living in Massachusetts. I was driving to my college at the time. I commuted to school. And this particular day was very snowy, icy, and sleeting. I don't know why school was in session, but in the Northeast, they don't take bad weather very seriously. I think we've all seen the memes of cars with piles of snow on them saying that they're heading to work. That's just New England for you. So anyway, I'm driving to school and I was late. The road which I was driving on was a two-lane highway that was very steep. Between the two lanes were Jersey barriers, and the opposite flow of traffic was on the other side. Like many roads here, there are no shoulders, and there was no turnaround. Once you were on this highway, you had to drive another five miles before you could pull off to the closest exit. It was the type of highway where if your car stopped, you were pretty much screwed because there was nowhere to pull off. Again, no shoulders or grass, just concrete barriers on both sides and a barrier in the middle. It was a dangerous highway that many people had died on. Even a friend of my mom's coworker had died on it. I was driving pretty fast for the type of weather I was in. I was in the far left lane and could see a tractor trailer in the far right, but behind my car. Suddenly, my car fishtailed, and I spun out completely. I was suddenly in the far right lane, facing oncoming traffic. The tractor trailer was coming at me. Like, coming at me. There was no time or place to go. I remember this feeling came over me, like my brain didn't register what was happening. And suddenly, out of nowhere, my car was in reverse, and I was in a miracle of a small shoulder, but still facing oncoming traffic. I don't know how it happened, and I remember being in shock. Like, how did that just happen? The tractor trailer blew past me in seconds. I mean, I would have been literal toast if I hadn't gotten to that shoulder. Breathing really heavily, I said to myself, did I really just do that? Within what must have been 10 to 15 seconds, I hear a few knocks on my driver's side window. I open the window and a young male police officer is now staring right at me. He says, hey, I saw your car spin out. I see the lights behind now and his car parked right behind me in the same small squeeze of a shoulder that we had, which ended quickly up ahead. Clearly seeing me in what probably looked like total shock, he continued and said, uh, you were going too fast. I said, yeah, I, I know. And then he says in this soft but direct tone, stop rushing. Why are you rushing? You need to relax, okay? Relax. It was something like that. He then says how he's going to stop the traffic so I can turn my car around the proper direction and get back on the road. It's fuzzy how he did it, but I just remember him stopping the flow. I turned my car around out of the shoulder. Remember that my car was facing the wrong direction, so I wouldn't have been able to do that without his intervention. And slowly I pulled it back in the proper direction that I was supposed to be going in. I continued on and I looked behind me. Normally, you can see a cop pull out after you, see their lights on or the car themselves if they turn it off or whatever. But all I saw were the cars that were waiting for me to drive. It's weird to explain, but this cop disappeared in seconds. I mean, disappeared. And like I said, there was nowhere for him to go. The only turnaround, 
that small cutout median that cops tend to use to go in different directions wasn't for another mile ahead, and the first exit off wasn't for another five miles. The small little shoulder ended up right where I was, and this cop was nowhere to be seen. It was so weird. I remember looking back several times in my mirror and saying out loud, where did he go? It was so odd that I thought about it all day. I came home and told my parents what had happened. Of course, in shock that my car spun out in the opposite direction and I almost hit a tractor trailer, I told them exactly where this took place, how my car went into reverse, how I have no recollection, and of the magical cop that showed up in 10 seconds and disappeared just as fast. My own parents thought that it was the strangest thing. I've told this story to a few people I know, and they've also thought it was weird. I think, and my parents agreed, that either that cop was sent by God at the exact moment I needed help, or he wasn't really a cop at all. It's been a decade, and I still think about this encounter. Without that man, I wouldn't have been able to get back onto the highway, unless I had taken a great risk or sat there in confusion and shock with the possibility of someone else hitting me, while snow, ice, and sleet fell on my car. It was a very peculiar and life-saving encounter, and whoever it was, I won't soon forget it. I used to work as a guide and then as a backup, and even as a field director for several wilderness therapy programs for troubled kids in Arizona, Utah, and Idaho. They were all good jobs, but where I worked in Utah was in the West Desert, south of Dugway. It's possibly the ugliest and creepiest part of Utah. Tons of sketchy stuff happened to us out there. This story happened in 2005. The groups were camped in a really nice area for that part of the desert. It was called Indian Canyon. This spot was so nice, in fact, that in the late 1800s or 1900s, some enterprising pioneer family had built themselves a little homestead with a one-room cabin and a small barn and a cedar pole fence around the perimeter of that little farm. All of that, of course, now was a crumbling, rotten ruin. The cabin, it seemed, had burned down well over 50 years ago, and what remained of the barn was poking out of the grass in two or three foot shards of gray wood scattered all over the nearby vicinity. This week, I was also camped in Indian Canyon, but farther down the road. I was manning the infield emergency response vehicle, or the ERV, better known as backup, a new position that I helped invent when I took a list of things that had gone wrong in the field to the directors and explained that because of the horrible response time and spotty satellite phone service, the only reason we weren't shut down or the people weren't dead was because we were lucky, not because we were prepared or efficient at responding to emergencies. Now we had radios and someone listening to them 24 seven, never more than a few minutes away with a vehicle. That's how it worked in theory anyway. One of the boys groups was camped at the mouth of the canyon in the foothills, about two miles away from me. The other just a mile beyond them. The girls were close too. I was camped somewhere in the middle of the canyon on top of a small ridge that had a little jeep track side road branching off of the main dirt road running up the canyon. And the girls were just a couple of ridges over, maybe a mile away, though to drive to them might have to go back out on the main road and take a different jeep trail up to their spot, maybe a five mile trip. I was about a mile and a half below the staff training group that was being held by my then wife, Jessica. There were going to be several groups of parents coming out to visit their kids later in the week. So both the boys groups and the girls groups, all on that side of the mountain, had all elected to stay put for a few days 
and work on building backpacks and gathering fire sets and a lot of other primitive skills. The training group had been in the field for almost a week and they were getting ready to split up and go join the student groups for the last several days of their training. This left me with less to do than normal. I didn't have to find new sites for groups or drop anyone's water or food. Everyone was well taken care of and no one was moving for several days. I decided to build a sweat lodge next to the creek, up near where the new staff were camped. I found the perfect spot, well out of sight of the group, on a little smooth sandbar right by the water. I got to work. I harvested some long willow saplings that were bendable enough to weave a frame with and arranged them in a 10-foot circle, digging down a foot and a half for each one to anchor it into the sand. I bent them into a dome at least four feet high and 10 feet across and wove the branches together with supporting crossbars until I had a structure that I probably could have stood on without breaking. I walked down to the truck, which I had hidden in some pine trees a quarter of a mile away, and hauled a large bin of tarps and cowhides and plastic sheeting, along with my fire set and some other gear, up to the lodge. As I was walking back to the creek, I remember feeling like someone was following me, but when I stopped to look, I couldn't see or hear anything. It was a beautiful day for July. The morning had started out with some high, wispy cloud cover, but that had long since burned off, and the noon sun was high overhead. It wasn't yet too hot, however. I was high enough in the mountains that the oppressive heat that I knew was slowly baking the kids' groups in the desert below wouldn't reach me for another couple of hours. I set to work placing hides first on my little domed frame, I covered those with some tarps and plastic sheeting and secured it all so that I had as close to an airtight and waterproof shelter as possible, with only a small arched opening for a door. I secured an old military poncho over the door so that once hot rocks had been placed inside of it, it could be sealed shut and the sweat ceremony could take place. I wanted it as hot as possible. There wouldn't be any children involved in this one so we could go as hot as we wanted. I took the extra time around the base of the lodge to bury all the edges of the coverings deep in the sand. This was as sturdy a shelter structure as I had ever built. It was nice. I spent a good hour gathering sage and juniper and covered the floor of the lodge with a thick padding of the fragrant plants. I did this in part so that it was a soft place to sit for an extended time but mostly I did it because I was intending to invite the new staff down to do a sweat ceremony later, to help some of them prepare to meet actual students for the first time. And frankly, a group of unwashed men and women who hadn't showered in a week in July, all crammed inside a sweltering homemade dome tent sweating buckets, is a smell that should not be endured without as much sage and juniper as possible. If it was really bad, which it was likely to be, I would rub some of it into my shirt and then pull it up over my nose and breathe through that. I went hunting for lava rock. I found an outcropping of some small rounded boulders, perfect for heating on a bonfire and then rolling into the lodge. And I proceeded to gather three onto a tarp. It was heavy, almost too heavy for me to sling over my back and carry, but I managed to make it back to the fire pit I had dug with all three. I left them there and went to gather more. I made this a smaller load because it's not like I was in a hurry. I could take more trips. When I got back to the fire pit, one of my rocks was gone. I just stared at the small depression in the sand where I had placed it minutes before and then looked around for signs that someone, possibly one of the staff from the group, had come and taken it. No tracks. I looked around again and spotted it by the edge of the creek, 20 feet away. I had that feeling again, like I was being watched, but I couldn't see anyone in the trees. I walked over and retrieved my stone, the heaviest one I had carried, and put it back with the others. Maybe it had rolled there, 
through flat, soft, dry sand? Unlikely. I gathered a bunch more rocks, and none of them went missing, and then I built a fire. As I worked, that weird feeling came back, only this time it felt more ominous, like it was mad at me for being there. I stood up, determined to walk out into the woods and find whoever it was. The radio, which I kept on and strapped to my belt, had been silent all day, but suddenly it crackled to life. Brian, in the boys group, was doing evening check-in a little early so that they could do their day hike without having to stop and contact me. After we talked, I felt more normal again. I cooked some rice and beans for dinner, and as they cooled off, I piled my stones, probably 30 of them, into a cairn in the center of the fire, and then just piled on all the dry wood and brush I could gather. I took my knife out of my sheath, because that feeling was back, still worse this time. As soon as my fire became almost irresponsibly large, I saw someone moving fast through the trees, straight toward me. I tensed, then relaxed. Will, a seasoned staff working in the training group with Jessica and Katie, came running down the creek. He stopped when he saw me and my sweat lodge and my 10 foot tall flames and broke into a huge grin. I thought it was a wildfire, he said. Some of the new girls are panicking. Nope, just an epic sweat lodge, I said. I was planning on inviting you all down for it when you called in, but I'll consider this your check-in. If you guys want to, you're all invited to come sweat. It'll be ready in about half an hour. Perfect, he said. They're just finishing up dinner. I'll go let Katie in just now and we'll be down. He turned to walk away. Hey, Will? He turned back around. Did you guys lose track of any of the new guys today? Or did one of you three come down this way? He thought for a moment and said, No, I don't think so. Why? That's nothing, I said. I, I just thought someone might have come looking for me when I was out gathering rocks. Some of my stuff was in a different place than I remember leaving it. That's all. He looked at me with an odd expression. Weird he said finally. I'll ask everyone, but we've kept pretty busy today, so I don't know when someone would have had time to come down this far. It's okay, I said. Don't stress it, I was just wondering. See you in a few minutes. The other two kids' groups radioed me shortly after Will walked off. It was more like an hour before the staff group finally trudged into my sandy clearing. Some of them looked excited, and some of them looked confused at my dome of plastic and sand and at my pile of glowing red boulders on the still blazing fire and at the stack of blue five gallon water jugs that I'd hauled down from the truck for the experience. We thought we were going to die in a forest fire, one of the new girls, Carol Sue, said accusingly. She looked extra smelly. I pulled some essential oils out of my possibles bag a possible's bag is just a type of leather purse we make on the trail. We call it that to disguise the fact that we're grown men who carry around purses. Put some of this on your wrists and neck. It will help you keep a good frame of mind in the sweat. How many of you have done this before? A handful of them raised their hands. Inside of the circle of the lodge is a sacred place. We will do four sessions going longer and longer each time. We will dedicate each session to a different part of our lives, our histories, our families, our struggles, and our choices. Try to only speak from the heart about these things. It will be very hot once we begin pouring water on the rocks, and the heat will make it very difficult to speak anyway. So only speak if it is important. Katie and Will were already rolling the superheated rocks into the lodge, using some long willow poles I had made. I gave Jess a side hug. The trainees didn't know we were married, and we had found it best not to let kids or people new to the wilderness group know, 
because it could have become a distraction from the experience if they got caught up in our personal lives. So, side hug was all. As far as they knew, we were just co-workers. I took out a dried sage smudge and lit it on the fire and did the ritual smoke cleansing for each of them as they entered the hallowed ground. I made the last minute decision not to go into the sweat lodge. That last boys group had a student that was a little bit of trouble and I was worried I would end up having to take an emergency radio call about a runner in the middle of someone's heartfelt speaking about their issues with their family or their past. Also, the smell. Also, something just felt off. This was a perfect spot and a perfect time for a sweat lodge ceremony, but it felt not wrong exactly, just off somehow. Instead, I whispered my choice and that maybe I would join the next session to Katie as she was the last to enter. And I sealed the door up behind them, burying the edge of the poncho in the sand like the rest of the construction. I stood by the fire for a minute or two and felt hot. So I walked in the water down the narrow stream about a hundred yards and just looked at the stars that were slowly becoming more and more visible in the darkening twilight. I stood there for at least 10 minutes, enjoying the changing sky. I heard a twig snap somewhere to my left and the crickets went silent. There was definitely somebody away up there in the trees. I stared hard and could not see anybody at first, but there was a small dark shadow under a pine, maybe 30 or 40 feet away too dark for this early in the evening. Was that a girl in the shadow? It looked like a small Native American girl with two long braids and some kind of headband. I called out to her, but she didn't move. She seemed to be glaring at me. And the longer I stood there, the worse I felt, like the warmth from the air around me was being sucked away. So I took a deep breath and I did what I always do in the woods when something unknown scares me. I ran at it. Whoever was there took off fast and I chased them. I lost them quickly enough, I'm not a runner, but I was sure they had been headed in the direction away from my little creekside sweat lodge. I must have gone an eighth of a mile, almost to the road, when I heard all the staff at the sweat lodge scream behind me. My blood ran cold and I turned on my heel and sprinted back up the canyon. I almost missed the sweat lodge clearing when I came to it because nothing that I saw made sense. The fire was out, not even a glow. The sweat lodge was gone. The tarps had all been pulled and ripped off and they and the hides were flung out in a wide circle on the ground in the bushes and in the water. The frame was uprooted and folded over on its side to one side of the sandbar, and all the new and experienced staff were sitting stunned in a circle on a padding of sage and juniper around a pile of cold rocks. What happened? I yelled as I ran up. After a moment, Katie answered, we were just sitting here, starting to pour water on the rocks to heat things up, and we started talking a little bit about what it means to know your personal history. The walls of the sweat lodge started shaking, and we thought you were outside trying to get in. It stopped for a minute, and Jess called your name, but you didn't answer, and we had just poured some more water on the rocks when the whole lodge went cold like really cold, and it sounded like a massive windstorm blew in and ripped the whole thing off of us, frame and all, and threw it into the trees. I didn't know what to do, so I grabbed my bag and got out every flashlight I had. We started checking each other for injuries. I lied to them through my teeth and told them that it was a microburst windstorm and that they happened sometimes in Utah and that they were lucky nobody got hurt and so on. Amidst the skeptical looks from the three who knew me, 
I got Jessica and Will to start taking the stunned newbies back to camp. But Katie stayed. Katie, who had been with me through so many other unexplainable things out here, knew what I was doing. She could tell I wasn't saying something. The fire is out. Like, it's out cold. And it was a thousand degrees 20 minutes ago. And the rocks that were glowing hot 20 minutes ago feel like they've been sitting in the creek, she said. What are you not saying? I took a deep breath. I just tried to chase down a Native American girl who apparently can run unnaturally fast in the dark. Katie sat down hard. I looked at her, but she didn't say anything, so I continued. Today, while I was gathering rocks for the lodge, I felt like someone was watching me the whole time, and I swear I'm not making this up, but I set down that really big rock, you know, the first one you rolled into the circle, and I walked away for a few minutes. When I returned, it was over by the creek, like someone came and moved it, but there were no tracks, and it couldn't have rolled there. And then after you all went into the sweat lodge, I walked down to the creek and heard something in the trees. It took me a minute to spot her, but she was hiding in a shadow under a tree. I think I chased her for maybe 30 seconds when you all started screaming and I ran back up here. What Katie said next made me sit down too. Did she have two braids and a headband? I nodded slowly. Early this morning, like three, Jessica woke everybody up and said it was going to rain and that we needed to build a shelter. There were no clouds last night, I said. I know, said Katie, but she woke us all up and insisted that we needed to build a shelter and she wouldn't drop it until we all moved closer together and put up some tarps. I like to see the stars if I wake up, so I moved in close just in case, but I didn't get under a tarp. Neither did Will or Josh, and he's one of the new guys. Well, this morning, just before it got light, I had a really disturbing dream where I felt like I was awake in my sleeping bag and was staring up into the trees above me. And there was this little Native American girl with two braids and a blue-gray headband up in the tree over my face, just staring at me. I knew I was dreaming, but I couldn't move or wake up. I was only able to move when Josh, on the other side of the shelter, yelled and sat up. I thought it was just a horrible dream, until I talked to Jess about the rain last night. She admitted to me that she hadn't been worried about rain, but that she had been dead asleep when she felt somebody reach into her sleeping bag and shove her head to the side. She panicked and laid there and pretended like she was still sleeping, but they knelt over her face for a few minutes. She said she was terrified to open her eyes. When she felt them leave, she waited for a few minutes and then woke everyone else up. I was wondering why she slept in the middle of everyone. Now it makes sense. I was quiet. Katie spoke again. Before breakfast, I asked Josh why he yelled and sat up. I was grateful he did, but was curious as to why. He told me that he'd had a horrible nightmare about a little Native American girl. And when he thought he woke up, he saw her running at him. He yelled and she jumped over his head and took off. And that's when he really woke up and sat up. He was surprised that I had heard him yell. He thought he was still asleep at that point and he dreamed the yelling part. I didn't tell Jess or Josh what happened to me, and I didn't tell them about each other. But at breakfast, Will told all of us about this horrible dream he had about a little girl dying in that cabin when it burned down. We all freaked out. It's all we've been talking about today. Half of the group didn't believe us, and Carol Sue, the loud annoying one, has told everybody that we're just trying to haze the new guys. Even Josh, who's a new guy, is in on it, apparently. And then the sweat lodge thing happened. With what you just told me, I don't think any of us were dreaming. We were quiet for a long time. 
I think we should move camp down the road tomorrow, I finally said. I'll clean up this mess in the morning. Katie just nodded and stood up. Oh, and Katie, it's probably a good idea for everyone to be under the shelter to sleep tonight. And also, maybe don't light another fire. I'm guessing the one at your group site is out too. She sighed tiredly and walked off into the dark. I just sat there for a while and then slowly made my way back to the truck. I didn't feel like anyone was watching me anymore, but that didn't stop me from sleeping in the cab with the doors locked for the rest of the week. My life was always crazy, but never did I think it was this crazy. This is my story. It was a summer day in 2011. I was 10 and my dad had gotten with his ex-girlfriend. That's a story for a different time. She had two boys. One was a year younger and the other one was older. I had a little brother as well. Now that you know the family, let me give you a little bit of background to this bone chilling story. My dad was searching for a house to rent after breaking things off with my biological mother, and he found this house, and what's crazy is that my name is Ashley, and it was off of Ashland Street. It seemed to be very cheap for the area. It was in a gated community, so of course it seemed very comfortable and safe. I mean, at least you'd think so. I moved with my dad into this house with his ex-girlfriend and her two boys, so there were four kids all together. We'll name them Kobe, the year younger, and Jerry, the older one, and then my little brother, Brandon. I have changed their names for privacy. It was an older house, so nothing brand new was built, but it was definitely pretty cheap. I mean, for a gated high middle-class neighborhood. We moved in. I don't remember the exact date, but it was in the summertime. I live in Vegas, so the heat is sometimes unbearable. One day it can be 99, and the next it's 104. My dad wakes me up and is really excited about moving out and just being free. My biological mother was a freeloader and a real piece of work. My dad and I picked up all our boxes and we went to the house. Now this is the first time that I was seeing it. But of course, my dad did a tour with the landlord. So I went through the place, picking my bedroom and all the fun things you do when you move into a brand new house. I shared a room with my baby brother, Brandon. He was like four or five at the time, so really young. I got the room I wanted, I guess out of the three I could have picked. It was a four bedroom, three bathroom house, two upstairs and one downstairs. The first night wasn't anything out of the ordinary. We got Little Caesars pizza and watched Cops, my dad's favorite TV show. We went to bed and woke up like normal and went on about our day. Again, still really normal, nothing crazy. The second night was just as normal. It was about a week into living in the house when things started to happen. It was almost like the ghosts wanted to make sure we stayed or something. How sweet. So it was more like night eight and I was walking up the stairs. I was alone in the house and the stairs had carpet. I walked up them and I swear I kept hearing somebody walking behind me, but every time I would turn around, nothing would be there. I just kind of kept it to myself and told myself I was just paranoid for being at the new house by myself. I was the type of kid that was scared of the dark and I still get scared easily to this day. I actually hate Halloween for that very reason. But these strange things just kept happening. The first spirit sighting was Kobe's birthday. He got a new spyware truck thing where you can put a camera on the toy truck and go around the house. It's kind of like a GoPro. Well, we decided to pull a prank on Jerry. So we put the camera in his room to prank him. He was asleep, so he would wake up and freak out that there was a camera. 
I mean, we were all under 12, so it was really funny to us, but that's not all I caught. I know the typical white woman in a white robe thing, I get it, but it was true. All we could see was a silhouette of a young woman, probably in her late 20s or early 30s, standing over him. Of course, as the two young boys were so sweet, they had me go up to check myself. So of course I went upstairs, a little spooked, but trying not to overthink it. And I went into his room. Jerry was still asleep and there was no woman in there. So I came downstairs and told myself that there's probably a glitch in the camera that just made it seem like somebody was there. So we all let it go. As some of you probably know, when you move into a house, especially an older one, the floor creaks and you might hear bumps in the night just because the furniture is settling, but only squeaks and creaks for a day or two. We kept hearing this noise, almost like somebody was walking up and down the stairs all the time. But again, we all just put it out of our heads and said that it was the house settling. Maybe something fell. No matter what, we would try to find an explanation for the situation. But over time, it just got worse. My dad had signed an 18-month lease agreement, but we only stayed there for four. Because this is when things got absolutely crazy. I went off to school. I was in the fifth grade. I had to repeat the second grade, hence why I was in the fifth grade at 10 years old. Anyway, my school was definitely a walkable distance, so I walked to school and back home. I got home one day and my dad's girlfriend was at work, and so was my dad. Kobe and Jerry were at their grandma's and Brandon was still in school, so I was all alone in the house. When I walked in, it was like something out of a horror movie. Picture this. You get home from a stressful day at school, and when you open the door, it literally looks like somebody has robbed the place. The stove was on. Yes, the stove like literal fire, was on. Of course, my immediate reaction was to call my dad and tell him what was going on. As I got into the kitchen, all the cabinet doors were open and most of the plates were on the ground, shattered. There was glass everywhere, even on the carpet. Thank God we didn't have any animals at the time. My dad, of course, got home with the cops and the cops came in and did an investigation all to find out that there was no foul play, so there was nothing anybody could really do. So of course, my dad's now ex-girlfriend blames me, but I told her that I didn't do it, that I came home to this. Unfortunately, my dad played right into her crap and believed her, so I was grounded for breaking her plates and causing a fire. I was so mad, but I was 10. What was I gonna do, run away? I kept trying to convince my dad that I didn't do this, but pretty soon he wouldn't need any convincing. While we were all downstairs playing and talking one day, upstairs in my parents' bedroom, there were three loud booms, all at one after the other, just boom, boom, boom. My dad and his now ex and myself all ran up the stairs to find that my parents' bed was broken. It almost looked like somebody had jumped on it really hard and that's how it broke. The mattress was caved into the bed frame. I just looked at my dad with a cocky attitude and said, so did I do that too? My dad actually apologized to me that night, but not his girlfriend. She never liked me, but that was another story, like I said. Under the staircase, we had storage. The door to that slammed, but the AC unit was close by the door. So I had just thought that maybe somebody had left it open and the wind had pushed it shut. It wasn't a very heavy door. The next night was definitely one of the scariest nights of my life. It was around 8 p.m. and we were all settling down for the night. I had school the next morning as everybody was going to bed. It was around 10 going on 11. As I was about to sit on the bed, I heard two knocks on the door. I could see a shadowy impression of feet under the door, so when I opened it, it was confusing to see nobody there. I closed it again, thinking that it had to be one of my brothers playing a mean trick on me. 
Again, I scare easily, so that was their thing. I heard the knocks again, and like the first time, I opened it. But nothing was there, and I didn't hear anybody run away. I went to Kobe's room. He was fast asleep. Then I went to Jerry's room, but he was still awake. He told me he didn't knock or anything, and that he'd been in his room the whole entire time, but I didn't really believe him. I had no choice to just go back to my room and try to relax. Probably about another hour went by, with nothing, no knocking or anything. But just as I had closed my eyes, I heard it again. I stood right by my door for about 10 minutes until the knocking happened again, and I immediately opened the door. Absolutely nothing. And then, in the silent darkness, I heard a giggle. I looked around the corner, and there was nothing there. Everybody was asleep, and nobody would have had time to get back to their bedroom. I just went to bed. I wanted it to be over so badly. The next morning, I tried to tell my dad what was happening, but he said I was just dreaming. I looked at him and said, so was the kitchen and the fire and the bed. That was all a dream too, right? Because we're all either having some really crazy Jumanji stuff happening or there's more to it. My dad just shrugged it all off and told me to get ready for school. So I did. Probably about another week later, I ended up staying the night at a friend's house. I'll call her Emma, just again for privacy reasons. So after school, I took the bus back to Emma's house. I decided to confide in her about what had been going on. Her mother was a medium, so I guess she could like speak to the souls that hadn't crossed over or something. Or as she would say, departed. When I came in close contact with her, she looked at me with fear in her eyes. It was like she knew what was going on before I even told her. She told me that I had a very negative soul attached to me. It was a female soul. And all I could think was maybe it was my dad's ex or even my biological mother. Two really horrible females. But she said that it wasn't anybody I knew closely. And that's when I started to piece everything together. The woman standing over the bed. The fire. The bed breaking. The knocking. The giggling. It somehow all made sense in some way. This spirit was stuck. But my question was, how did she get there in the first place? My dad picked me up the morning after, and I discussed with him what I had kind of put together. He said maybe the landlord would know more. So I told my dad to give him a call and tell him the pipe was loose or something so he could come over and have a conversation. You know, trick him, I guess. If he doesn't want to go into detail about it, he's definitely not going to over the phone. My dad agreed, and a few hours later, the landlord arrived. My dad called me downstairs, and we decided to go over everything with him, from the fire to the glass to the bed breaking to the woman standing over the bed. All the color drained from his face, and I immediately knew that he knew something. As we were all talking downstairs in the living room, there was this mirror on the wall in front of us over the television. We're sitting on the couch, and as I looked up, I saw a lady wearing a very tall, almost like black witch hat, and she had very long gray hair. She just looked off, like I knew from somewhere, but didn't at the same time. Of course, I reacted very startled, and my dad told me to relax. Like, yeah, dad, let me just relax why all this stuff keeps happening. Why don't I just tell the ghost to make us a campfire as well? He didn't find it funny and sent me to my room. The landlord eventually left and fewer questions were answered. It was like he didn't want to say anything. Like, our house almost blew up into flames and there was glass all over the kitchen. This isn't the time for secrets. Anyway... We looked up the address on a background search for properties, and we only found two things that could have been connected to this haunting. The first thing was that the entire neighborhood had been built on a Native American burial ground, but that seemed a little cliche, so we kept digging. And then we found something even sadder. A young couple was there. They had lived there once. They had two children. One day, out of nowhere, the dad came home drunk. He shot his wife and two kids and then set the house on fire and shot himself. 
Unfortunately, the house did burn to the ground and their remains were never found, so nobody knew who they were. It made total sense. The fire that started, the loud booms, the knocking. It was a sick memory that I'll never forget. I really hope that family rests in peace. At least the wife and the kids. I can't imagine being taken out like that by your own father and husband. Anyway, that was the haunted house on Ashland Street. I've never been back since we moved out, and I'll never go back again. So let me start by saying that my brother and I are extremely experienced desert campers, and we have lived near deserts pretty much our whole lives. I have never in my 20 years of life ever for one second believed in anything paranormal or anything to do with evil spirits. Unlike my brother, who has always sensed presences and been able to see mostly what we call jinn, also known as demons. Last night though, Things changed for me, and it marks the last time that we'll be camping alone in the desert. We've always had the same place we like to go whenever we want to camp with minimal effort. Our day started as normal as ever, but as we got closer and closer to our destination, I saw my brother's mood completely shift. When I asked what was wrong, he just shrugged me off and told me to just keep driving. When we arrived, I felt completely fine, but my brother was still unusually quiet. It was around 1 p.m. at that point, and we were planning on leaving at about 12 to 1 in the morning. Because of the heat, we made the terrible decision to set up under a few trees and a source of water, which in the Middle Eastern culture where we live is where the jinns live at night. Not that I believed in that at the time, of course. However, we still set up our camp and continued on as normal. Now, my brother always says that when he feels a presence, or several in this case, he gets extremely unlucky. First, he almost dropped a box of coals on his foot. Then he spilled an entire bottle of Coke on his phone. Then he dropped it into the sand and proceeded to smash his elbow on the edge of the chair he was sitting on. His elbow is now very swollen. And last, but certainly not least, when he was looking through one of our boxes, he felt something cold and sharp right against his arm. He realized it was an unsheathed knife, which we packed with its case the previous night before. And later he said that it felt like something had pushed his hand into it, right where his veins are. All of these events consecutively occurred within a matter of a few hours, which made us both uneasy, and I, for the life of me, could not figure out why he was suddenly so unlucky. As I was starting to question his clumsiness, a random couple appeared out of nowhere, informing us that they were stuck in the sand and needed help. We drive a land cruiser and they had a Nissan Altima, so we didn't expect to encounter as many issues as we did. We first dug them out without any issues, but as we pushed them out of the sand, they got stuck again. If you know anything about dune bashing or desert camping, then you understand the physics behind how wheels get stuck in sand, and the way this Nissan was stuck was incredibly unusual. It was literally stuck somewhere with plenty of space available for grip, and later my brother said that as we were digging them out of the sand, that's when he really started to feel like an evil presence was around us but he didn't want to say anything and ruin the trip and freak me out. We ended up having to tow them out of the sand, which again was much harder than it should have been. First, our tow strap broke off of their bumper. The tow strap cost $200 and was fine, but their bumper was slightly damaged. Then we almost got stuck ourselves in a 20 minute job that took more like 90, which again was extremely unusual and with hindsight, just the beginning of all the crap to come. When we came back to our camp, we noticed how everything around us had gotten unusually quiet. 
The area we were in has hundreds of birds around, and as far as we have seen, three cats who sometimes pay us a visit. But there wasn't a single noise at all, other than our fire, which was dying out unusually quickly. It had gotten dark so fast that we had to scramble to build a fire to cook our dinner, before we were asked to help the couple. And I had noticed the silence, but it didn't bother me. My brother suddenly grabbed my hand as we were sitting down to eat, and said with clear fear in his voice that we should get going as quickly as possible, that he didn't feel safe. To ease both of our minds, we prayed. We are both Christian, so of course we thought it would help, but I think it accelerated everything that happened and just made whatever was there angry. We quickly finished our dinner, and me being the skeptic, I was completely fine staying there, but I wanted to humor my brother. But that's when I started getting the nagging feeling that it was time to pack up and leave. It hit me like a wave, and I was quite taken aback by the feeling. So I voiced it to my brother, and he agreed that we should pack up right away and leave. We started packing up at a normal pace, like we were just tired and wanted to go. And that's when we heard a sound very close to us, on the opposite side of the pond, which wasn't that big, that I could only describe as the sound of death itself. It seemed to go on for several minutes, and when I say that we looked at each other in absolute fear, I genuinely mean it. I was about to have a heart attack right then and there. At that point, after being frozen for a few minutes, and quite reasonably so, after hearing that bellowing screech so close to us. We turned on the car, drove it back so we could see better with the headlamps, and just started throwing everything into the car without much care, but with a whole lot of urgency. After the screaming, everything hit the fan. First it was the sound of twigs snapping and footsteps all around us. Then it was the shadows behind the trees. I tried everything to get those shadows to change shape walking around the trees and moving lights, but nothing. It looked like there were people just staring at us the whole time. You could really feel it too. We genuinely felt like we were not alone and that we weren't with friendly entities either. We also noticed that all three cats were huddled right behind our car, away from the trees. So they were not the ones snapping the twigs. At that moment, I was really hoping they were going to move so I could get us out of there safely, and thankfully, when we slowly started to reverse, they took a hint. But they looked absolutely terrified, and were just staring at the trees, too. It felt like whatever was there was getting closer. I've never felt anything like it. It was a gut feeling. It was just one of those natural instincts you can't ignore. Thankfully, we were able to pack up quickly, our tent was very close to the trees though, so that was a nerve-wracking experience. And while we were packing, it was still very silent. It's very normal for the birds around that area to continue making sounds until 2 or 3 in the morning. And at this point, it was about 8 p.m., so highly unusual. I personally think I was most terrified as I was driving back onto the main dirt path to leave the desert. I know cars very well. I know how they drive in the sand, and I know our car especially well, because we've had it for so long. I could instantly tell that the steering was off, and completely fighting against me. This fixed itself the second we were on the highway. The sounds of twigs snapping was still all around us, and it was loud enough to be heard over the sound of the car. On the path was what seemed like every bird in the area just standing there and staring at us until we got close enough to force them to walk, not even fly, away. At one point, my brother just grabbed my shoulder and told me very sternly to just keep looking in front of me and under no circumstances to look through his window. It was the tone of voice that told me to listen to him for the love of God. We were in a part of the desert where we had to pretty much drive through the whole of the accessible areas to get onto the highway again, and there wasn't a single person around us. The only thing we saw was a very clearly abandoned Toyota, positioned behind a small dune 
and hidden by the trees, but was far enough from our campsite to easily rule out as the source of the original screech. The worst thing I saw as we were closing to the exit was that we saw in the middle of the path, staring directly at us, a deer. A deer. I have only seen one deer in 16 years of living here, and that was in someone's garden as a pet. It's safe to say that I was in complete shock. The deer was just not moving at all until I got close enough that we could practically smell the thing before it slowly walked off the path while looking right at us. We quickly moved past the deer and again, my brother, with a grasp of my shoulder and a stern voice, said to keep my eyes right on the road. I asked him later as we got onto the highway what it was that he kept seeing and he very reluctantly told me that he kept seeing large figures around us any time we went through a bend and they were all either pointing right at us or ahead of us. I'm glad he didn't tell me at the time because I probably would have crapped myself. We still hadn't encountered anyone, but we still very clearly heard sounds all around us. And again, not the usual bird or cat, but big unrelenting sounds. When I saw the exit, I was as happy as I have ever been, but that quickly faded when once again, we saw another deer standing right in the middle of the road, slowly walking away and looking right at us. But this time it didn't really look like a deer. It was more like a kangaroo mixed with a deer and its eyes were milky. It looked rotten and horrible. I didn't much care. I just stepped on the gas and fortunately it got out of the way in time. When you exit the desert, you can either turn right onto a long stretch of highway, or you can go left and go through a small town, then take the back streets to a parallel highway. As I was about to turn right, my brother once again, with that same tone of voice, said to go to the town. Later, he said once again, that he saw a line of figures pointing ahead of us, so if we would have gone the other way, we probably wouldn't have made it home in one piece. Thankfully, as we made it farther and farther away and closer to our home, the gut feeling of being watched was going away. And of course, having never experienced something like this before, I was distraught and wanted to talk about it. My brother told me as we were going home that because we were alone, the djinn wanted to mess with us, that they wanted to scare us, and most likely cause us harm. And that the way they get you into such rural places is to force you to stop and then do whatever they want, which makes sense as to why there were so many animals blocking our path. He also said that they caused bad luck and he could feel them the second we entered the desert, which explains his clumsiness all day and the car that got stuck in such an unusual manner. Because he's my younger brother by three years, any time he had ever told me about this sort of thing before, I always just dismissed it as him scaring himself. I can excuse the sounds we heard and the shadows we saw last night. I can excuse the gut feeling as just being scared, but I cannot excuse the two deer we saw staring right at us, and I cannot excuse the car just randomly fighting against me as I was driving. The deer completely freaked me out, as did the tone of my brother's voice. It's safe to say we're not going camping there again. And it's also safe to say that I will never dismiss my brother when it comes to this kind of thing again. I'm so thankful to God that he was there and that we made it home safely. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors. So he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. 
For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife, specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt, large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet as he was behind me. So I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up. And at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. 
About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was just my luck, but that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. 
I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped, and then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose and open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back, and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. In order to really convey how scared I was when this happened, I'm gonna have to back up and give you a little context. For starters, I've told the whole story to maybe a handful of my closest friends, and the only family I've ever told is my twin sister. Even then, it only came up because they initiated conversations about similar topics regarding the paranormal. If I can help it, I'd rather not talk about it in real life. But here, on the wilds of the internet though, I guess I feel a little bit safer. It's also worth noting that I've included several instances that may or may not be related. Whether or not they truly are is a matter of personal speculation, but they are all paranormal nonetheless. If I had to pinpoint where it all began, I would say it was 2008, when I stayed home alone pretty much all summer. My sisters attended the Boys and Girls Club, and my parents worked all day. I was just a 13-year-old boy then, so staying home alone was pretty much the greatest thing I could think of. All I had on the agenda every day was eating junk food, playing video games, and doing whatever small chores I was assigned. Not a bad way to spend a summer. And it wasn't. For a few weeks, anyhow. When things started, though, they started small. Every couple of days, my mom would come home pissed off when she saw both of our dogs outside. We lived in North Alabama, so summer was hot and swampy. Because of that, we tended to keep the dogs inside until they needed to be let out to do their business, but it would never be any more than about 10 minutes. I loved those dogs, so I adhered to the 10 minute rule very strictly. It was also why I was so confused to see them outside on those days. I definitely did not let them out. Sure, I can be forgetful sometimes. Maybe one or two of those times I really did just have a brain fart. But I was 100% sure that most of those times I never let those dogs out. When I told that to my mom, she looked kind of concerned. Then I started hearing things. With freshly installed hardwood floors, I was familiar with the sound of them settling when the AC kicked on. It would be one or two popping sounds, then it would stop, until the AC turned off again. Rinse and repeat. Nothing crazy about that. One day, while I was binge playing old Nintendo games, I heard the boards settling again. But this time, it wasn't because of the AC. 
and instead of one or two pops, there were several dozen moving around. They went up and down the hallway, like somebody was pacing around. I paused my game and I listened to them. Thinking maybe my mom or my stepdad were back early from work, I went out to see them and make sure the dogs were back inside so I wouldn't get chewed out again. But nobody was home. I shrugged it off as the floorboards just being particularly active that day, and I went back to playing my game once more. About an hour passed before the sounds repeated. The same quiet little footsteps. I paused my game again, and I listened harder this time. Another sound surfaced on top of the steps. It was kind of like trying to hear somebody else's phone call from across the room. You know there's a conversation going on, but you can't quite make out what it's about. I went to look again, this time going all the way across the house and into my parents' room. Still nobody. Then I thought, well, maybe the conversation was coming from outside in the neighborhood. I brought the dogs out back with me, and they went and did their business while I waited on the porch. From what I could tell, it was just another stiff, silent summer day. This particular thing happened a few more times, and it always made me feel really uneasy. It was even worse when I told my mom about it. She replied, oh good, you hear it too. Then she went on to tell me not to tell my stepdad, because he was very religious and for some reason didn't believe in any of this stuff. Things settled down after summer was over and they stayed that way for a while. I had school to keep me occupied, and other than a few small instances, we had two quiet years. 2010 was the year things picked up a lot more. While my twin and my girlfriend at the time were hanging out in her room, they started messing around taking dumb pictures with digital cameras. Now, my twin's room was the coldest in the house, and nobody could ever figure out why. It also used to belong to my older sister. Both times either of them moved into the room, their demeanor would change over the course of a few months, where my older sister became more manic, throwing tantrums with growing frequency. My twin was starting to get depressed, sleeping all the time and always being fairly disconnected. While all three women in the house suffered from manic depression, bipolar disorder, and sometimes both, there was a very noticeable difference when my sisters occupied the room. And that digital camera my twin was playing around with? There was a picture on it that we didn't find for weeks after the fact that showed my girlfriend at the time and a really weird, smoky, veil-like presence in the room with them. Neither of them smoked, and the room never smelled like anything, so we weren't allowed to have candles in our room either. I'm still kicking myself for not saving that photo somewhere, because I think it might have been a good piece of evidence. On top of the apparition caught on my camera, my mother told me of an instance where footsteps walked from the kitchen and into the study, where she worked on some stuff for her job. When the steps entered the room, she heard a voice whisper, ouch, very clearly into her ear. The next few experiences were things only I witnessed. They are, by and large, the more extreme parts of what I now guess to be a haunting, and they started in the summer of the same year, with my first episode of sleep paralysis. I had known about the phenomenon before it happened to me. My mom was a sufferer of frequent night terrors and the occasional paralysis. I also had a friend with narcolepsy that told me about it at school. The first time it happened to me, I wasn't too unsettled. It was on a weekend, and I drifted off watching Netflix. The next thing I knew, I was wide awake, and a few episodes of the show had gone by. I reached for a bottle of water by my bed, but I found that I couldn't move at all. It was strange, and almost calm. I just kind of accepted what was happening, and I let it run its course. It eventually did. I got up, had a drink of water, went to the bathroom, and then went back to bed. A few days after the paralysis, things started moving around on their own. Another day spent home alone, I was once again playing video games and avoiding any responsibilities. As I had tried giving up soda that year, I almost always had a cup on my desk, filled either with orange juice or empty. There was rarely an in-between. 
This cup, however, just fell over in front of my eyes. There was no slant on the desk or anything like that. Nothing other than the cup was on it. It just tipped over, like someone had smacked it over. While I thought it was odd, I set it back upright and went on with my gaming. I had settled that it was some kind of trick of gravity, which in hindsight sounds way more ridiculous than a poltergeist. This was immediately followed by the sound of a bird hitting my window, my light bulb exploding overhead, and the cup once again tipping over. Unable to rationalize it this time, I scrambled out of my room and into the kitchen, where my stepdad was eating. As I said earlier, my mom asked me not to talk to him about anything paranormal, but I was pretty shook up by what I had just seen. He asked me if I was alright. I told him that a bird had flown into my window and kind of scared the crap out of me, to which he laughed. I didn't sleep very well that night. The last and most extreme incident I had at that house happened just about a week later, my second episode of sleep paralysis. It was a Sunday morning and I could hear my family moving about the house to get ready. It didn't take me long to prepare myself, so I tended to sleep in an extra 15 minutes. As I fell back to sleep, a familiar feeling came over me. Unable to speak, I couldn't call for help. The weight on my chest made it difficult to breathe. I was incapable of moving. Thinking it would pass like last time, I just waited. It became evident very quickly that this was not going to be like last time. What little daylight there was coming in through the curtains turned blood red. Instead of the calm I had during the first episode, I grew very unsettled. It was dark now, and the room looked like one of those photo development rooms in terms of color. My door opened on its own. A figure stood there, just looked like a silhouette, all dark and shrouded. It wore what appeared to be a robe made of thick fur, and kept its hood drawn over. Even though my room was normally comfortable, I felt the temperature drop. I could see my own breath and the breath of this figure. It just kept staring at me. Something about it felt evil, like it was waiting to do something awful to me. I tried to yell and make it go away. I even attempted to invoke the name of Christ, but I couldn't speak or breathe enough to do so. The blood red changed to pitch black. The figure disappeared into it, but a pair of dark red eyes pierced through me from where it stood. I then saw two numbers sort of fly at me, 13 and 3. That's when the paralysis ended, I got up, and I went to church. I've since lost my faith and I'm no longer religious, just what I saw that morning is still a mystery to me. But I did follow up on those two numbers that same morning in church. Psalm chapter 13, verse 3, reads in the King James Version, quote, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Needless to say, I got chills, and I still do every time I tell the story. Not dear. For my college screenwriting class, we were split into groups, four students each for a group project. The assignment was to select a myth or legend to base a 10 to 15 page screenplay on. My group thought it would be interesting to choose a cryptid for the project rather than a well-known historical myth or legend. Our teacher cleared us for the idea and we started brainstorming. Of course, we didn't want to do the most well-known cryptids, like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot, so we started looking up some lesser-known ones. One of the ones that somebody pitched was known as the Knot Deer, in some cases the Night Deer. According to people's stories, it looked almost exactly like a large deer, but something felt horribly off. Only when they drove away did they realize what was specifically wrong about it. Still, even before they understood exactly what was going on, 
every story mentioned the overwhelming sense of wrongness. Quoting someone else's personal account, quote, It was a deer in the way that a graveyard is a playground. You can treat it as such, I guess, but it won't feel the same. End quote. Lo and behold, after a bit of research, I found out it was located in North Carolina. Not only that, but it was just over an hour away. Just about every written or publicized story of the knot deer supposedly took place in Boone, North Carolina and its surrounding areas. I informed the group of what I had discovered and being spontaneous as I am, told them I would be driving out to the location that very night. I figured I probably wouldn't come across anything, even though I was legitimately curious. At the very least, it was something interesting to do, and I'd be able to accurately describe the location and ambience of the area to the main screenwriter. I wasn't able to convince the other three members of my group to go with me. They all had their legitimate reasons, and since I made the decision to go so suddenly, I understood why none of them wanted to go with me on the trip. Still, I had nothing else to do that night, and I had been itching for more travel ever since the entire pandemic started. I filled my roommate in on everything and asked if he wanted to go with me. At first, he told me that he would just consider it, but as I was getting ready to go, he told me that he had decided to tag along. One of his main reasons for doing so was that he felt like he had to go with me. I shrugged it off, not thinking much of what he said. After filling up my car with some extra gas and buying a couple of snacks for the road, I plugged Boone, North Carolina into my GPS and I headed out. My roommate and I were pretty relaxed for the majority of the ride there. We joked around, listened to all sorts of music through the radio and CD player, and had some of whatever snacks we had bought earlier. Eventually, we got close to Boone. That's when we started to feel like something was off. It wasn't a feeling strong enough to make us want to turn around, but it was worth mentioning to each other. When we got into the city, it was just about what we imagined. Gas stations, car dealerships, dollar stores, and small cafes. All of them were closed at the time, with our arrival in Boone being at around 9.10 p.m. But all of them were well lit and unintimidating. My roommate told me that we should probably head back at about 9.30 and that he would let me know when that time came around. I agreed with him since I didn't want to spend too long searching for an experience. Needless to say, when we didn't come across anything by 9.30, he decided to let us keep going for another half hour. The clock in my car's dash had been broken for a while now, and I couldn't look at my phone while I was driving, so I was totally reliant on him for the time. Had I known that we were going to be driving in the area past 9.30, I probably would have mentioned it and turned around sooner. Had I done that, I would have completely missed the experience we ended up having. I'm still unsure whether or not that would have been a good thing. We ended up in Tennessee by 9.50. That's when things started to get really bad. At this point, we rarely came across any other cars on the highway. We took the first exit we saw and ended up driving along more mountainous, forested roads. This meant that there were lots of tall, dark trees, almost no streetlights, and twisting roads that forced you to slow down. My roommate said he started to feel bad about the whole situation, and I agreed wholeheartedly. Still, there was nowhere to turn, so we continued going straight, since that was really the only option for the time being. A few different times, we got a serious sense of dread, but usually that feeling disappeared by the time we got onto the next section of the road. There were a couple of times that the both of us had started to tear up, not because we were sad or upset, but because it felt so wrong to be there, like it was somewhere we were not supposed to be. The feeling of dread was very particular too. It wasn't feeling bad in the sense of depression or anxiety. The best way to describe it is just that sense of wrongness. It came in waves, 
not sticking around for a long time, but not going away entirely either. By this point, my GPS had stopped working entirely. Both my roommate's phone and my phone said that they had full bars, but mine simply refused to connect to anything. Luckily, his GPS still worked fine, so he plugged in the directions for home. It continued taking us down that road for a while longer. The area started to become much more forested as we went on, and the road started to twist and turn much more than it had before. Basically, we had come across the exact area where you would expect a monster to be. We started to feel really, really bad. I don't think I can express the feeling well enough with words, but it was the worst we had felt so far. But we knew something wasn't right. We both felt like we just weren't supposed to be there, and we felt like we had to get out. Since my roommate started getting truly spooked, that put me on edge even more, since he never gets scared by anything. There wasn't much we could do about it, though. The GPS still wanted us to follow the road, so we both awaited its next directions, eager to get on the highway back home. The sense of dread still came and went with every other segment of road that we crossed. Eventually, the GPS wanted us to turn. My roommate told me to turn right on that road, I knew he meant to turn right onto the road and follow it straight ahead, but for some reason I figured we should just turn around and backtrack. I started slowing down, and we both started to feel the absolute worst we'd ever felt. Like things are very wrong and something was about to happen. My roommate said that my eyes were glazed over, and I kept saying something along the lines of, I just need to turn around right here over and over. The more I said it, the quieter I got, until it was just, I just need to turn around right here. Keep in mind that I am normally a fairly loud person, and I had been loud the entire drive up until this point. I pulled off onto a gravel dip on the side of the road. Along the gravel dip was a thin chicken wire fence, shiny and silver. Back on the road behind us was a wall of dirt and rock. We were surrounded by tall, dark trees that blocked most of the night sky. Even with the headlights on, it was very difficult to see far ahead. He said very forcefully that we couldn't stop and we needed to keep going because he felt really bad, but I wasn't listening to him. I wasn't quite processing what he was saying, and for some reason I was having a difficult time hearing him at all. After he realized he wasn't getting through to me, he broke into a literal shout and told me that we had to get out of there. We could not stop, and we could not go back that way. It took him using his road rage voice to snap me out of it and get me to speed down the road. The only word I can use to describe what I felt in that moment was absolute terror. Even as I was slowing down, I felt it get worse and worse until it was almost overwhelming. I only realized that after we had gotten out of the area and back onto the highway. As we passed through the area and started getting into the city again, the looming sense of dread started to fade away. By the time we got onto the main highway, we felt safe again. But in the moment that I pulled off onto the gravel dip on the road, where I had almost stopped the car entirely. That was the most terrifying experience I've ever had in my life. I would bet my life savings that had we turned around, we would have seen something that we never wanted to. Both of us admitted to tearing up as we drove off from that spot. I was much more shaken up than my roommate was, and it took me a little while to fully process what had actually happened. I think it's safe to say that even though I didn't explicitly see anything for myself, I found exactly what I was looking for. This happened in mine and my husband's first house several months after our oldest son was born. We had lived in the house for almost four years before he was born. 
but had never experienced anything like this before. It's actually the only time I've ever experienced something that I would consider to be paranormal. My husband claims his grandma's home was haunted growing up. Either way, this experience shook the both of us in a whole new way. We had finally decided to move our son into his nursery. For the first six to seven months, he had slept in our room in his own bassinet, but we decided it was time to get him adjusted to his crib and his room. So we gathered the strength and made it happen. We had dug out the baby monitor that my mom had gotten us months prior to set up security, if you will. Granted, this was 1997, so they weren't anything fancy, but enough to help us feel better about our choice to move our son into his room. In addition to the baby monitors, we had put up one of those moving night lights in his room, the ones where the lampshade would project the pictures onto the wall, moving ever so slowly. This one was made up of friendly sea creatures, and our son loved it. The first night that we actually slept separately from our son, we both woke up at the same time. My husband looked at me, and I looked at him, and then we listened to the monitor for a minute, but it was quiet. It didn't appear that our son had woken us up. So, what had happened? I almost just went back to sleep, calling it jitters. But my husband sort of grabbed my arm, not hard, but firm, and he whispered, What the hell? while looking straight ahead. Following his gaze, I could see that each of the four drawers to our dresser were pulled open. I turned on the light and we both hopped out of bed. It was around 2 a.m. and we weren't sure what was going on, so we didn't speak with our mouths, just with our eyes. My husband grabbed his military knife and motioned for me to follow him. I did, and he handed me another, smaller knife, which I held tightly, continuing to follow him, me against the wall, him in front of me, walking toward the baby's room, and leaving no blind spots as we did. When we got to the room, my husband opened the door swiftly, and with force, but quietly. It was just our son, fast asleep, no one else. My husband tells me to stay with the baby while he checks the house. I ask him to please call 911, and he tells me that he will as soon as he gets downstairs. He tells me he's going to shut the door, so when he does, I set the knife down, pick up my son, and sit. I was just rocking him, back and forth, staring off at the fun sea creatures dancing all over the walls. It was comforting. After sitting or rocking for a while, I started to feel a bit warmer. Not like a fever, but best described as how it feels when somebody sits really close to you. You can feel their body heat. While feeling this, I'm looking down at my son, debating if he looks or feels warm, but he looks comfortable still sleeping ever so soundly. Suddenly, a mitten on my son's left hand flies off in a way that it might if someone had ripped it off of him hastily. He wasn't moving his hands, and this hadn't woken him up, but it certainly got me up. I was now standing, breathing a bit heavier, and wondering where the heck my husband was. Moments later, my husband opens the door. It scared me at first, I just really wanted the sound of footsteps approaching to be his footsteps. When they were indeed, I was so relieved and I hugged him and I told him rapidly that we had to get out of this room. He wasn't whispering any longer, telling me, okay, let's go back to our room or even downstairs. He started to shuffle us out saying the police were going to send someone by. He said he checked everywhere in the house. No one could possibly be inside. He seemed to feel better but I was still afraid. We made our way to the family room, which was on the first floor, center of the house, really. You could see the whole area from the top of the stairs and from two of the bedroom doorways, our room and the baby's room. From where I was sitting, I could see the nightlight reflecting off my son's walls. So I watched them again. This time I was wary of the room though. I couldn't help but wonder what the heck I had actually experienced up there but I just tried to keep my cool while waiting for the police. My husband asked me what I was staring at. I said, our son's room. Then I told him what I had felt in there. 
At first he sort of smiled, but then in all sincerity he said, Maybe it's a ghost. I said, Excuse me? He didn't elaborate. Probably because of the loud knock on the front door. The police were here now, waiting for one of us to let them in. Long story short, there was no guy, no person, no nothing, at least not in our house, and not the surrounding area the officers had checked. It was a quiet night in our town. I wasn't having it though, at least not that night. I told my husband we should go get a hotel, have our parents and such search the place again tomorrow. He said he would stay at the house, but that he would send my son and I to his mom's house. By the next night, maybe it was even two nights that had passed, my husband had convinced me to come home. We were on the phone, and he told me that the home was fine. He had decided that we had just overreacted. For a bit, I guess I agreed with him. When he picked us up from his mom's house later that day, I asked him what he thought about the mitten incident, the one that flew off our son's hand. He just smiled again, and I asked what he was smiling about. He just thought I had nothing to worry about. He said, think of it like a guardian angel or something. No harm has come of this thing, right? I told him he couldn't be serious, that if he thought our house was haunted, we should go now back to his mom's. Then we somehow just sort of found a way to laugh it all off. By the time we pulled into our driveway, I was very excited to sleep in our bed, happy to be home. And I actually felt sort of silly for making such a fuss. My husband put our son down in his room and then joined me on the couch with the baby monitor. I remember laying there sort of nodding off as we watched some late night TV. Above the TV are the two bedroom doors. My peripherals are on my son's bedroom doorway, but I'm only keeping it there in the event something about it changes. I was nodding in and out for a bit before I'm wide awake, sitting straight up. My husband says something like, Whoa, what's wrong? But I just turn his head to the upstairs, and he sees the same thing that I am. The fun sea creature light is spinning, rapidly, or at least it's projecting as though it is. I tell my husband to go turn it off. Just as I do, we hear the sound of something falling. We know it came from our son's room, because we heard it externally, but also through the baby monitor. He hopped up and ran upstairs. He heads into the room and he's gone for a minute. When he comes back out, the baby is in his arms and also the diaper bag. He calmly asks me to grab our bags, which were still by the door, and to follow him to the car. We get settled and he tells me that he's running in just to grab some of his overnight stuff and to lock the doors. Then he's gone. So I do. I lock the doors and turn the headlights on, just wanting to illuminate all of that darkness. My husband dashes outside, he's got a handful of stuff, and without a word, he buckles in and starts to back out of the driveway. We start heading back toward his mom's house. I hadn't even asked what had happened up to this point, but about five minutes in, I had to know. He was checking to see if the baby was asleep, as though he could actually understand what we were about to talk about. It was sweet, but also a little unsettling, because he, my not-scared-of-anything husband, was terrified. He said, we're gonna stay with mom for a minute and then figure the rest out. Maybe sell the damn place, it's too small anyway. Sell the house? He just looked uncomfortable, trying to get more out of him, but having a hard time with it. He finally said, it opened up his drawers. When I went up there, the light was going nuts and his drawers, they were wide open. We can't stay there. And so we didn't. Sure, we got our stuff, but we never stayed there and we didn't bring our son there anymore. In the end, we had the place blessed, handed over the keys and haven't really looked back other than to talk about remember when, which isn't exactly frequent. Basically, I don't miss that house, not even a little bit.
First, a little background information that's important to fully understand the story. My mother's sister and her husband have a house in Colorado that has a finished basement. The basement has a fully furnished bedroom, bathroom, a sort of living room area with a couch and TV, and a little kitchenette as well. I grew up visiting my three cousins, aunt, uncle, and grandparents every summer from the time I was five up until two or three years ago. I'm 21 now. The basement became more or less the guest room, so that's where I would stay whenever I would visit, so that I could have a little space of my own. That and the fact that their cat rarely ever went down to the basement and I am severely allergic to cats. This particular event occurred around the time that I was 17 or 18, and my younger cousin, I'll call her Megan, was around 16 or 15. The night started totally normal. We all had dinner, listened to music, watched something, and then at around midnight, we all headed off to bed. Because of a different experience I had down there a few years prior, I was really nervous about staying in the basement alone. So, my wonderful cousin Megan took one for the team and had been staying in the basement with me for the duration of my trip. We had been chilling in the living room of the basement for about three hours, drawing and just hanging out, when it all started. I was in the process of explaining the premise of a show I had started when we heard what sounded like an old man clearing his throat coming from the bathroom. I knew it wasn't her since I was maintaining eye contact with her the whole time and her mouth hadn't opened at all. And she also knew it wasn't me since I was in the middle of speaking. And of course, neither of us are old men. We both paused and then confirmed that we had both heard the cough. Our minds immediately went to, there's a man hiding in the bathroom, since they had had some people in the past attempt to break in through the basement windows. I wanted to go upstairs and get one of her older siblings to check it out, but Megan insisted on checking it out ourselves. We went to the bathroom, turned on the lights, and saw that it was completely empty. There was, however, a linen closet, which had the door closed. She opened the door and we saw what honestly looked like the shape of a man trying to hide under some blankets. Megan immediately reared her leg back and kicked the blanket with full force, only to discover that it was just some blankets spilling over the lower shelves that we had forgotten existed. As Megan tended to her now stubbed toes, we heard that same cough come from what sounded like the entrance to the basement. We slowly crept out of the bathroom, looked around the basement to no avail, and without a word, both started packing up all of our stuff, like our sketchbooks and my laptop. And rather than leave the basement, we just went to the bedroom and locked the door. There was a giant floor length mirror in the room which we used to bar the door. We did all of this in complete silence, some weird primal understanding going on between us that we had to be as quiet as humanly possible. As we tiptoed around the room, we heard what sounded like shuffling outside the door. At that point, I was still somewhat convinced that there was a living person in the basement with us since the sounds were so clear and the feeling of there being someone else down there was so strong. Megan settled onto the bed while I sat against the wall next to the vanity, charging my phone. We were texting each other rather than speaking, since that pressure of being silent was still incredibly intense. We decided to each spam text her siblings, trying to wake them up to come down to our rescue, but there was no reply. Megan even texted her mom, but still, nobody woke up. I texted my mom, who did wake up, but all she said was to call the police if we were certain that somebody was down there with us. While we knew that there was something in the basement with us, we didn't know if it was actually someone who had broken in, 
and neither of us wanted to risk bothering the police for something dumb. After about an hour, Megan's phone started dying, so we decided to switch spots. For some reason, neither of us really understood. We were so terrified of making any sort of noise that we made sure to walk on our tiptoes and take steps at the exact same time to minimize the amount of sound we made. At one point, Megan started smothering me with a pillow because I had an allergy attack and kept sneezing. With the both of us now situated, we tried to relax, still being kind of terrorized by the sounds of someone shuffling around outside the door and the occasional cough. At around five, we heard what sounded like a small animal fall into the grate that also acted as a window for the basement bedroom and begin running around. The rocks at the bottom were moving and bouncing off the window, and then it went silent. About 10 minutes later, it sounded like another animal had fallen in and the sound started up again. This cycle continued for pretty much that entire hour. The entire time that all of this was happening, Megan and I were terrified. It was like that feeling you get right before your car gets rear-ended or right as you're about to go down a giant roller coaster hill. Just plain fear anxiety and the subtle feeling that something is just not right. It doesn't sound like much, but for some reason, Megan and I were just absolutely scared out of our minds. We both understood that we were not alone in that basement and whatever was down there with us was actively trying to freak us out. We were saved at around seven. The sun started to rise and we heard my uncle get up to take the dogs out. Neither Megan nor I had slept at all, and we suddenly felt exhausted as the adrenaline that had been fueling us the entire night seemed to die out. The sounds hadn't stopped, but they had significantly decreased as the hours passed. Now, hearing her dad up and about, we felt a little bit safer leaving the comfort of the bedroom. We quietly and quickly moved the mirror back to its space on the wall, and then, on the count of three, unlocked the door and ran to the stairs. We didn't stop to look around or turn off any of the lights, even though by that point the basement was fully illuminated with the sunlight and the lights that we had left on when vacating the living room. We booked it up the stairs and came to a screeching halt in the kitchen where her dad was making coffee. We immediately told him everything and begged him to check out the basement still not fully convinced that it wasn't a normal person. He checked and sure enough, nothing had been tampered with and the entire basement was empty. Megan made some ramen for breakfast since we were starving and just wanted something comfortable. And after eating, she went upstairs to tell her mom. I stayed downstairs eating and trying to come to terms with what I had just experienced. Her mom didn't believe her at first but when I told the same story and Megan almost started crying from not being believed, she changed her mind. My aunt was resistant to the idea that her house, specifically the basement, was haunted. But then, later that year, she experienced it for herself. The main thing I remember from this whole ordeal was the fear. It was so raw and intense and there was just this weird knowledge that we weren't alone down there and that whatever it was, was not good. Megan and my other cousin theorized that it was Theodore, the name they had given the resident ghost that stays down there, but I don't think so. Nothing like that has happened to anyone else ever again, and it's just not what we know to be Theodore's style. I don't know. I don't know what was down there with us. Or who? I don't know why they were there or what they wanted, really. But there was something with us that night. And it scared me in a way that I have never, ever felt since. I am not new to the paranormal, and strange things happen to me from time to time. 
I'm an empath, so I think that makes me more open than most. My earliest experience that I can remember took place when I was about 10 years old. A bit of backstory. When I was eight years old, we moved from Cheshire, England to Secunda in South Africa. It was during the time of apartheid in South Africa in the early 80s. The way of life there was very different to what I had grown up with in rural England. My dad had always wanted to live in the sunshine and he landed a job at Sassel. The company he was working for in Cheshire was laying people off at an ever-increasing pace, as were many other local factories, and I think he was worried about being next. We had been living in Secunda for two years when we moved to Van Nykirk Street, a lovely big house that my mother fell in love with. It was the first house we had owned since moving to South Africa. So we packed our meager belongings collected over the last two years and moved from the smaller house Sassel had provided us closer to the center of town. We had a lovely lady who was our nanny and maid named Julie. She had started to work for us about two weeks after we arrived in South Africa, and she stayed with us for many years. In those days, it was normal to have help in the house. The houses even came with small bedrooms and a toilet in the back garden, known as a kaya. These rooms were not connected to the main house, so the worker could come and go and have privacy. Many of the local house workers lived in the more rural areas, so they lived in town during the week. Julie moved with us to the new house. She was also thrilled at the move, as her room at the new house was bigger and had a bath with a shower. Julie at this point had worked for us for a few years and took care of myself and my little sister while my mother worked full time at a local hotel. Julie was Zulu. The Zulu tribe are a very superstitious people and to this day make use of a sangoma or a witch doctor to cure illnesses and curse people, paying the sangoma for the privilege. Julie used to tell my sister and I about the bad spirits she believed in, and the stories of the Tokoloshi, the evil dwarf devil that used to climb onto young women's beds and have his way with them, making them have kids and then leaving them to raise the spawn. Lovely. To prevent herself from becoming a victim to this creature, she had her bed up on bricks so that he couldn't climb onto it. Most young women of childbearing age did this, at least if they believed in this thing. One morning, she walked into the kitchen looking very shaken. My mother sat her down and gave her a mug of sweet tea and asked her what was wrong. She blurted out that she had had no sleep that night and that evil spirits were haunting this house. My mother pressed her and once she had calmed down, she told my mother the story. The previous night before bed, she was writing a letter to her family by candlelight. Julie always had candles burning, and my mother was very conscious that one day she would burn down the kaya. While she was writing, her candle went out. She assumed it was a breeze, so she got up and put a spare blanket across the bottom of the door. The kaya did not have any windows, and it was made of solid breeze block. So the crack under the door would be the only source for the breeze. She decided to leave the big light on to finish her letter. It was then that she was startled by the flushing of the toilet. It just flushed all by itself. She didn't dare go into the bathroom, but apparently the toilet flushed at least twice an hour all night until about 6 a.m. when it finally stopped. My mother said she would call a plumber to look at the toilet told Julie to take the day off and just sleep. Julie went off to the neighbor's maid's kaya as she did not want to go back to sleep in her own bed. My mother had an emergency plumber out later that day who said there was absolutely nothing wrong with the toilet. He said he had no clue how it was even possible that it had flushed by itself. Over the next few days, Julie calmed down enough to move back to her room. The toilet still flushed and now and then the taps on the bath would turn on by themselves. My mother told Julie that it was probably a plumbing issue and that it wasn't an ancestor or an angry or evil spirit. All was calm until Julie woke up one morning to find her room wrecked. Her clothes were scattered around, ornaments broken, 
She had slept through all of it. At first, she suspected her room had been broken into while she slept. But when she went to the door, it was still locked and bolted from the inside. Julie refused to stay there after that and moved a few things into her friend's Kaya next door. About a week later, a large crack appeared in the wall of the main house. My father was concerned that the house would fall on us with the speed that it appeared and called the surveyor to come out and take a look. He determined that the foundations of the house were faulty and that they needed to be stabilized. Basically, a trench was to be dug all the way around the house and concrete poured in to reinforce the house. The work was urgent, so it started the following week. This was when things started to happen in the main house. Shoes would go missing and appear outside, in a trench, as would keys. The fridge blew up, followed closely by the washing machine. Our two dogs would bark at thin air, the hairs on their backs up. The toilet in the main house started flushing by itself too. It was then that my dad joked that we had a ghost with the runs. We heard voices in the garden and would go outside and see nothing. As the trenches were dug deeper, the reason for all the problems came to light. Out of the holes, the workers hauled broken bits of headstone and human bones. In fear, the workers refused to dig more and left the site. The headstones that were pulled up were shiny, smashed, large pieces of marble, not pitted as you would expect them to look having been underground for a while. I personally don't remember there being any writing on them. I remember thinking that they would have been great for tap dancing on until my mother caught me and told me off. The police were called and our house was officially declared a crime scene. The bones were taken away to be tested. The local press heard about the story and it made the front page of the local paper. My sister and I, posing with a large piece of the gravestone near the trenches, graced the covers. The police sent a team to dig up the rest of the garden and locate all that they could. My mother told me that they found pieces of several skeletons. About a month later, we were given the all clear to fill in the foundation trenches and all the gravestones and all of the bones were taken away by the council. The local police chief told us that Secunda was built over three farms. It was built by the factory for the employees. In those days, farms had family burial plots on them and the generations of the families who ran the farm were buried there. When the farms were purchased, they apparently collected up all the graves and buried them in one hole. Our house was built on top of it. The police assured us that the remains they collected were relocated to consecrated ground and buried with respect, and that headstones stating the family names of the original owners of the farms would be put there. After that, the strange happening stopped. I hope those souls found rest in the end. We stayed in the house another year after that, but Julie never did come back to the house. Instead, she left and started her own business with the help of my mother. When we moved, she came back to live with us again, her bed still on bricks. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently hearing about missing 411 and the like, I finally felt like I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. Hopefully you enjoy this story. I've been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon and felt comfortable in the woods, and I have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. We found our campsite to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs, who need the privacy, since they're intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It wasn't an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off of a U.S. Forest Service road that had flat ground, full trees, and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. 
It was maybe two feet away from my wife and I's tent. We made the male German Shepherd sleep with her in her tent. His name is Guts. That whole first night, neither my wife or I could sleep. We both heard footsteps, and they were heavy. Not like typical forest critters scampering around in the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from having read recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and I had my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection and that's why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided had to be a deer or maybe some elk. Day two, morning. We go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away, we see this circle area. I see this abandoned road where a rusted gate post was covered in vegetation. The gate was missing. Something of a blue color caught my eye and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race because I think if it's another family camping like us, he's gonna get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. So I chase after him as fast as I can and the rest of the family follow. He stops after 20 feet into the road and me yelling his name, but I've covered just enough distance to see that there's nobody there but there's something really off about the sight. I yell, hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the sight conditions are. As I get closer, I just know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, everything but every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed, and torn apart from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, puzzled why anybody would leave all of their camping gear behind, including a fairly expensive REI tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry and the animals got to the rest. It had to be the only logical explanation, right? Still, a propane tank and a cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, my daughter and I are playing ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I don't have a direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight toward her. Normally he would always be with me, unless he's called over and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there and my wife starts jogging at me and I immediately draw my pistol. Guts has completely continued running into the forest another hundred feet before I call him and he stops. My other dog, Leia, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I've had her for now seven years, and this was the first time in her life that she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was full hair raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leah is up front, bossing everything in her path, pausing to see where we all are and then continuing on. I asked my wife what had happened, and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hair raised. I knew someone was watching me. Then I saw Guts running toward me and I just got up to move toward you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, no broken branches, nothing to point to what and where something might have gone. We decide that we're spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we'll all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can and some coins and keys from our truck and zip tied it 
so that anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing that I have done with a rope that was so old and brown I didn't see it at first. It was broken, and only a few pieces remained. But sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height, about 8 to 10 inches off the ground, and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt that someone had stayed here before and had put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree that I am, maybe 10 or 15 years ago based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure that the girls felt we were safe. And at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came, I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my 45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we were armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that knows that we have two wolves and are armed and are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night we heard no footsteps and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left early the next morning. Fast forward to today and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 hunted documentary and I noticed the cluster smack dab close to where we camped that weekend, and a flood of dread rushes at me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and the smashed cooler and cooktop. We've been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the Pacific Northwest, but there was something there, at that place, that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped. We all thank our lucky stars that Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. As an update, Guts is no longer with us. He has journeyed into the next phase, and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him and how he likely saved us that night. He was a warrior, and his new brother, Geronimo, has his spirit. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll give you the facts of what happened and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about his proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths, and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool, so we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. 
We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory. We made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately, websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising, since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident. Until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20 something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb. I come along thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn. So we get there at around 11 PM. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road and flashlights can only do so much. So our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actually deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic, one that I've never felt before in any forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly, we hear crunching, coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, I might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked along the side. And that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers but I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, she nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chat her up, flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her, with that slow, creepy smile, while slightly undulating, I still don't know what to call it, but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, 
Oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes. Except there's not a single bar anywhere even close. Not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her, and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread. This feeling just keeps increasing, so eventually we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old looking smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, she's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs, her smiling face undulating from the shadows. This incident occurred during the summer of 1983, as I was about to begin my senior year in high school. My family lived in rural Pennsylvania, in northern Indiana County. Our farmhouse was built in the mid-1800s. In the early 1900s, an addition was added to the back that more than doubled the size of the original house. The original house was a four-square house, so-called for the four square rooms, two on the first floor and two on the second floor, with a staircase in the back. The house as a whole was sturdy, albeit a bit cranky. Every night in summer, I fell asleep listening to the pops, cracks, creaking, and groans as the house cooled off in the night air. The house was built on high ground next to the mouth of an ancient ravine that ran for over a mile deeper and darker and rockier as it went, down to the north branch of a little creek. The ravine was heavily wooded at the beginning. Then the trees got sparser to a few old ones tenaciously rooted into the eroded rocks and glacial till. It was dark and cool and damp down in there, even on the hottest summer day. And I spent many summer days down in those woods. I knew the plants, the trees, the birds, the deer. I heard much that I couldn't see, like the rabbits running through the brush and the squirrels high up scolding me as I walked. I could sense the ones that hid and made no noise, the bobcats lurking in the nocturnal critters and peeking at my back after I passed their burrows. Sometimes sudden waves of total silence would descend on the woods. The air would be still, the birds would silence themselves. I taught myself to stop at these moments and to observe. I knew it wasn't me that made the animals go silent, so I figured something, a bobcat perhaps, was close by. I never saw what it was that caused the silences, but I loved to imagine myself as a skilled tracker. Nothing of the sort, of course, but I will claim to know those woods. I also had a friend and companion that roamed the woods and ravines around with me, a big male German shepherd named Chap. Chap loved to run and roam and chase groundhogs. We prowled along through the woods for years. This particular night, I awoke suddenly, very awake and alert. The wind was blowing against the open window. Our room had the crank out windows that were popular in the 70s when the hose had been remodeled. The bottom of the window tilted out and the rain ran off. There was a low rumble off in the distance, the thunder of a summer storm blowing in from the west. I was laying on my belly, my face on the left side on my pillow and my arms around and under my pillow. I listened to the rain. It was not unusual for me to wake up in the middle of the night it's been a regular occurrence in my life since I was very young. By that point, I was 17 years old. I was used to my 3 a.m. ritual, though still very irritated by it. Across the room, I could hear my brother breathing. I could hear our dog lying on the foot of my brother's bed, sniffing at the rainy night air blowing in the window. Across the hall from our room, I could hear my dad's low, steady, rumbling snore. 
Then I heard something that made my eyes fly open in the pitch black room. From down in the ravine, off in the distance, I heard an animal call unlike any I had ever heard. It was a roar, an angry roar. To the best of my knowledge, the apex predator in those woods was the bobcat, but this was too deep, too throaty for a bobcat. Then I heard it again, surprisingly closer, a lot closer. I listened for my brother's breathing, silence. He was awake. What was that? I loudly whispered. I don't know, he whispered back. There was obvious concern in his voice. Then we heard it again. It had to be no more than 75 feet from the house, down at the corner of the yard where the trail led into the woods and down into the ravine. First of all, it was no bobcat. It was not a dog. It was not a coyote, and it was most definitely not a man. Next to my bed was a softball bat. I still have it, as a matter of fact. That night, all I wanted in the world was to slide my hand out from under the pillow and reach down and grab that bat. But I couldn't move. Everyone in the house seemed paralyzed. I kept expecting to hear my dad throw his bedroom door open, but he never made a sound. Then, two things happened in rapid succession. There was a tremendous crash, like something or someone had run headlong into the house. Then there was another roaring, screaming howl, this time right next to the house. It was an angry, roaring shout, so loud that I felt like it was next to my face. I had never in all my life heard an animal make a noise that loud. It was like a V8 engine with straight pipes was running wide open throttle. At the same time, there was a throbbing, a low frequency growl that seemed to make the house vibrate. All I could do was close my eyes and try to scream, but nothing came out. I must have passed out. The next thing I know, it was morning. The sun was shining. The house was still there. I slept in, which was very unusual in my family. I went downstairs and my dad and brother had already left for the day. My mom stood at the sink, washing dishes. I looked at my mom wide-eyed. Surely she had heard what happened. She met my eyes and pointed to the back porch of our house, a small side room that housed the washing machine, dryer, and coat closet. I walked to the back porch to see that the door that led to the outside had been ripped from its hinges and lay flat on the floor of the porch. In the coat closet, with his nose pressed as far back as it could go, laying in a puddle of his own urine, was Chap. He lay there, whimpering for two days before he finally came out again. I was given the task to fix the door. When it was up and repaired, I went to my mom and basically asked, are we just going to pretend that nothing happened last night? My mom sighed with obvious exasperation and said something along the lines of, well, what would you like to know? You know what that was. Your dad knows. I know. We all know. Not much to talk about, other than how scary it was. And frankly, I don't need to talk about that, thank you. And for my family, that was pretty much the end of it. I brought it up once not long ago. My dad just shrugged and said, I know as much now as I did that night. Me? I drive there on occasion, when I'm in the area. I stop on the old country road and listen a while. I listen to the wind and the birds, and then I drive on. My family and I moved to Colorado when I was eight, so around 1997. We lived with my brother and his family for a while until my parents found a more permanent place to settle. We had a few terrifying experiences in this house. The short version is that his basement was almost certainly home to something very bad. 
But these are my stories about some of the experiences in the house that we moved into after leaving my brothers. I will give you as brief a description of the place as I can. My parents found this house almost in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, it is now surrounded by new housing developments and stores. But when we first moved in, there were just fields for miles and miles, and we had a gorgeous, jaw-dropping view of the Rockies. The land left adjacent to our property was Rocky Flats, the place where they stored nuclear reactors and who knows what else, underground for years and years. They claim it's all cleaned up now, but we still get dragonflies bigger than my head in spring. And once I even saw a two-headed bull snake in the backyard. Anyway, my parents got a good deal on rent and the landlord was fairly agreeable. To an outsider though, the living arrangements probably seemed strange. Our landlord was basically renting out his basement, but the house functioned like an apartment building. We had our own entrances and our own driveway and garage, but we shared the mailbox and address. The main drive into the top portion of the house was a huge circle that branched off on either side going downhill into our section of drive and house. On your way down, you would pass this little brick building with a glass window and a very old, very visible toilet and a bunch of junk. It read, general store on the front. When my parents inquired about this strange setup, the landlord said that the whole property used to be a gas station a long time ago, when the highway that ran in front of the house was the only way into the mountains. Later, the big hill eroded a bit from the weather, and we found an old tank and bucket stuck in the hillside, corroborating the story. The rest of the area was farmland. A steep drop below us behind the house was a horse stable, and beyond that, a pasture, where a farmer would rotate Angus cattle throughout the year. All of this is just to give you a sense of the area. We were literally surrounded by nothing, and sometimes it was a bit terrifying, albeit beautiful. First experience. One of my first nights sleeping in the house, I had a very vivid dream. As a kid, I never really had vivid dreams, so this was something entirely new to me. I remember walking out of my room in my dream and coming directly into the living room. My mother was sitting in her chair staring at the TV, but there was a circle of people standing right in the middle of the room. People I didn't recognize and who didn't register me being there. They were looking at something on the floor in the middle of the circle. When I squeezed past them, I realized they were looking at a woman, lying on the floor, presumably dead. She was wearing a long, mauve-colored Victorian-style dress, and her blonde hair was long and covered her face. I say she was dead because she wasn't moving, and a good chunk of her dress was visibly stained with blood. The most chilling part of this experience, however, was that her body was floating about four to five inches off the floor. When I noticed this detail, I also noticed that the people around her were chanting. As soon as I noted these two things, I woke up. Second experience. This one will forever give me chills when I think about it, and I will never forget it. I don't remember how long we had lived there at this point. I remember it being a normal night. My parents had gone to bed and I was tucking myself in. I don't remember dreaming about anything else that night, and if my memory serves me right, I had fallen asleep instantly and went right into this experience. I'm laying in bed, eyes closed. I can feel my body is asleep, but my mind is awake. I feel eyes on me. I open my eyes and see myself floating above me, staring down at me in bed. Then out of my periphery, I notice another me crouched in the entrance of my walk-in closet, also staring at me. Both of the me's had glowing red eyes. I remember wanting to scream, and when I closed my eyes to do so, I opened them again, and now was on the ceiling staring down into my bed. Bed me was still there, but it too had glowing red eyes. Closet me was also still there. 
they were both staring up at me. I screamed in silence. They began to grin wider than any human should be able to. And then I fell. I woke up in that instance for real, drenched in sweat, still in my bed, feeling like I was going to vomit. I didn't sleep the rest of the night, and I've struggled with terrible insomnia ever since. Third experience. Remember the cattle herd that I mentioned earlier? Well, I'm pretty sure they were mutilated. My dad used to look out our back door with binoculars, just to watch scenery and spy on distant neighbors. One day, I came home from school, and he hands me the binoculars and says, Look at the cow pasture. Tell me what you see. It took me a minute to center on the right area, but once I did, my jaw dropped. The field, which usually housed about 50 head of Black Angus cattle, was completely empty, save for two black lumps on the ground. Ever since we moved there, that field had never been empty. We couldn't see properly that far away. So that night, my dad and I crept down the hill with some flashlights to get a closer look. The two lumps turned out to be two cows, no heads, legs, or tails, and the torsos that were left were completely hollowed out. It wasn't like something had killed them and then snacked on them over time, no. We had coyotes come through all the time. We knew what that looked like, and also, these coyotes avoided these carcasses like the plague. They didn't smell, there was no blood or viscera, and the cuts were surgical. Everything about it made us creeped out. The farmer that owned that chunk of land never came back with the rest of his cattle, and eventually a for sale sign was erected after the bodies had rotted away into nothing. Those are three of the experiences I remember best from that place. Don't get me wrong, it definitely had its beautiful moments scenery-wise, but living on what was previously known as Rocky Flats was definitely weird, to say the least. For our next story, Redditor The Odd News shares a fascinating tale about a coal mine and the ghost he encountered within it. Here's the story. I was born in 1968. I am the son of a miner, a father, and a miner myself. I'm the father of two children. The incident happened to me in the mine where I worked a year or two before I retired. Everything started after an accident in the mine. That day, I went to the workplace as usual. In the morning, after having breakfast in the canteen, I got into the cage to go 260 meters underground. When I say cage, I mean an elevator. We mine workers preferred to call it a cage instead of an elevator because it was a simple device that worked with a large crane rather than a true elevator. Anyway, I went down to the mine after working until the end of the shift, I started walking toward the bottom of the shaft. We call the place where we get into the cage the bottom of the shaft. As I was walking slowly, an engine passed by me quickly. What we called an engine can be considered to be a small train. It was a relatively simple device compared to the train, pulling only wagons weighing up to one ton at most. There were workers on the engine. Normally, they are forbidden to do this, but sometimes when the workers are very tired after work, they ride on the engine to avoid walking. I continued to walk slowly as the engine sped past me. Then, there was shouting coming from up ahead. Someone seemed to be moaning in a wheezing voice. I moved toward the direction of the sound in order to understand exactly what was happening. I started to look around carefully. When I approached the place where the sound was coming from, I saw that somebody was lying in the water channel on the side of the air door. Blood was flowing from the person, like from a faucet. At that moment, I went into like a short-term shock. In that chaos, we immediately carried the injured person to the lift entrance. 
that bottom of the shaft and sent him to the hospital, I still couldn't get over the shock of that image. That day, the person that was injured in that accident died. This incident affected me deeply. My psychology was turned upside down. According to what I learned later, the accident happened as follows. While the workers were traveling with the engine, the air door did not open. Since the engine was also fast, the engine hit the door with great violence. The worker who was caught between the engine and the door was crushed badly during the impact. In the days following this incident, when I passed through that gate, it always seemed to me as if somebody was still lying in that water channel. I couldn't pass through there by myself. Since the hearth was not sufficiently lit, it was always very dark inside there. It was only illuminated by fluorescent lamps, which were very sparsely placed in certain parts of the hearth. Because of the effect of this incident, I was completely disenchanted with work. I didn't feel like going to work at all, but I had to. Anyway, one day when I was at work again, I was the last one left at the end of the work in the area of the mine where we were all working in. When I looked around, everybody had left. I sat down somewhere. Such a weight fell on me that it seemed like a lifetime to go from there to the lift area. I said to myself, I'll just rest a little where I'm sitting and then I'll go. My eyes closed for a while. I was between sleep and wakefulness. I saw a man approaching me from up ahead, holding a lamp in his hand. There is no work left at the stove at this hour. I guess he stayed later, like me, I said to myself. That light that was approaching suddenly disappeared. Oh my gosh, where did this man go? I thought. Then I just thought, let me sit for one or two more minutes. Maybe the man who just disappeared will come back and we can go to the lift together. Then my eyes closed again. I don't know how much time passed, but suddenly I woke up with a very severe slap. But what a slap. I thought my neck was broken. I immediately recovered and looked around me. There was no one. It was impossible for somebody to hit me and run away and me not see them. For this reason, I started running toward the lift in fear and panic. That day, I didn't tell anybody about what happened. One or two weeks later, I was the last one again. This time, I hurried up and went straight to the lift entrance. As I sat down and waited for the lift to arrive, I noticed that something jet black was coming toward me. It had a hand lamp and a hard hat, but neither of them was lit. It was slowly approaching me. I called out, Master, what's wrong? Did the lamp malfunction? He didn't answer. Instead, it just kept coming toward me slowly. I felt such a strong sense of fear, and I didn't know why. I wanted to get up and leave. I even wanted to run away, but I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. Although he was very close to me, I couldn't see his face or body clearly. It was as if the man coming toward me was not a tangible substance, but a shadow, a silhouette. Don't ever sleep on the hearth again, he said to me. I could feel the man's speech, not in my ears, but in my brain. He spoke to me almost telepathically, and then he disappeared. I had heard of such events from a few other people before, but I never believed it. At that moment, all those stories that I had heard went through my mind. I read all the prayers I knew. That black silhouette had not harmed me, but living that moment had further disrupted my already broken psychology. I couldn't get up from where I was sitting for another one to two minutes. After a while, I pulled myself together and walked away from there. When I told my friends what had happened to me, they didn't believe me. When I told what had happened to me to the Imam of the village where I lived, the Imam did believe me and said the following. They are the owners of the mines. As you know, according to Islamic belief, the souls of martyrs can choose to stay in this world instead of going to the hereafter if they wish. According to a saying of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, those who die under the rubble are considered martyrs, just like those who die in war. That's why we call people who died in the mines, mine martyrs. 
Most probably, that thing you saw in the mine was the spirit of a mine martyr, and it warned you. He wanted to protect you. After my visit to the Imam, and after that day, I never slept in the mine again. In November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace, and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor, and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but I'm skipping it for now. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going. Week one after leaving the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity wing, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think of it too much. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the week that I was there, and about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior, with no incidents but onwards of week two coming home from the hospital, a lot of things started happening. I kept a journal and I've written it out here. So this is exactly what happened and how I felt about it at the time. November 22nd, 2017, whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th, first unusual cold spot. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room, never cold there again. December 11th, the baby mobile's batteries drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries last a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours, was eventually moved to my mother's house where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being alone in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home. Was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter begins to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th. While outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses from day one of being there that she felt like somebody was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th. We decide to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away in an upright position. 
This is when my husband believed me about what I'd said while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues listed above. October 29th. A doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it, nor leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard nobody in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal, but basically the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th. Our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealings with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th. Our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for some MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One who has never set foot in our apartment prior commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when no one was in there. June 29th, my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was done. The house felt still, like frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof of the outside stairs. I lived in a multifamily home and the stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after, my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in the old house. I told her why, and that we weren't moving back there. She replied with, Good. Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. What is it about mirrors that make them so creepy? I can't figure it out, but I do have a true personal story involving one from my childhood. I grew up in a small town in the Piedmont region of Virginia. Rolling country hills, one high school, everyone was your neighbor, that sort of thing. It was me, my mother, my father, and my brother. And just for the purposes of the story, my brother is six years older than me. Well, my town was pretty small, as I said. So small that my family, my grandmother and her husband, and my great-grandmother and her husband all lived in three separate houses, about a mile apart from each other. Once my great-grandfather died in 1989, my grandma moved in with her mother to help take care of her, as she was getting old in years herself. This didn't bother my grandma, as she and her husband's house was only 500 feet down the gravel road. I don't remember too much about my great granny. I just remember that she was always very grumpy, and that she would always yell at my brother and I when we would go over to her house to play. My brother and I would do this because our house was very small, and our great granny's house was big, an open Cape Cod style house with plenty of room to run around and spread out our toys. When my great granny passed away in the first week of February 1994, it took a toll on my family, 
because within that same week, my grandfather passed away as well. This means that my grandma lost her mom and her husband, both within about five days' time. I also should mention that my great granny was on hospice care, and she died in the comfort of her home, in her chair, surrounded by her family. As I grew on in age, about eight to ten years old, I started to retain a better memory about that house, and how honestly creepy it was. The upstairs in particular, as my brother and I were ever really allowed up there. This became especially true since my grandma ended up selling her and her husband's house down the gravel road, and permanently living in this one. And due to the trauma of losing her mother and husband in one week, she developed a pretty bad hoarding habit. Sometimes when my brother and I were visiting, my grandma would be occupied with her Avon downstairs, and we would sneak upstairs to snoop through all the four cluttered rooms. But one room up there always caught my attention. I found myself feeling very lightheaded whenever I would go near it, and sometimes feelings of unease or dread would overcome me. It was just your normal room, very small, hardwood floors, and only a twin bed and a small dresser, and a lot of junk. Like old Christmas boxes, Avon products, and my great granny's worn clothes. But over in the corner of the room, right beside the small crawl-in storage area, was a mirror. I always found myself strangely attracted to this mirror for some reason. It gave me an eerie sort of feeling, one that I can still very much recall to this day. I often caught my brother giving it a strange glance every now and then too. It wasn't until I started seeing this mirror in my dreams that I began to question its history and why my consciousness was showing it to me in my sleeping state of mind. The dreams were very vivid, and as frightening as they were, I never questioned during the dream itself what was happening or why I was there. I sort of felt like I was there for a reason. They all started with me standing on the porch of the house, staring at the door. It was nighttime and quiet all around me with a slight breeze. A very warm and comfortable summer night. The dream progressed with me making my way into the house, except something was a bit off. I was floating, and whenever I would enter a room inside, the door would open for me. All the lights were off inside, but I could still see from the full moon eerily casting its bright light through the open windows, the outside breeze making the curtains dance around inside. Everything seemed to be in slow motion. I make my way upstairs where I'm guided each time to the same room with the mirror. This is the part of the dream where I sense an impending feeling of doom. I make my way in front of the mirror, but oddly enough, I never see my reflection. I'm forced to stare at it, when all of a sudden an apparition of my great granny appears. Her skin looks gray and cold, her eyes dark and hollow. The uneasy feeling grows more and more as I start to realize that I am now aware that I'm dreaming. I'm scared to death and I need to wake myself up, somehow. Then, all of a sudden, the image in the mirror turns truly sinister. Her mouth widens, and her eyes glow a deep shade of red, and she lets out the most terrifying scream. This is when I wake up, covered in sweat. I had that exact dream a very many number of times growing up, but I never knew its significance, if there was any at all. I never told anyone, not even my grandma. Fast forward to about four years ago in 2012. My grandma lost her battle to cancer on Mother's Day. My family and I took part in the huge responsibility of cleaning up that house, as we had plans to sell it and move to San Antonio, Texas, where we currently are. The dream had escaped me for some time. I hadn't had it in about 10 years. But when my brother and I, now in our 30s, had the duties of cleaning out that room, the eeriness of it all returned to me. We had a lot of fun times up here, snooping around, didn't we, little brother? He said. I don't remember too much of it, but yeah, fun times, I said. My brother lifts his finger and points. 
Hey, do you remember that mirror right there? Yeah, I said. It was always really creepy to me, but um, why do you ask? To which he replied, just wondering. I'm not sure if you ever knew, actually, but that mirror was our great granny's favorite mirror from her childhood. Then it just so happens that right below that mirror, directly parallel to downstairs, is the chair that our great granny died in. As if that didn't make my skin crawl enough, he pauses for a quick second, smiles, and with a bit of a confused look, he says, you know, for some reason, I used to have the strangest dreams about that mirror. This happened in Fresno County, November 2015, around 3 o'clock in the morning. I am a medic on an ALS unit, and I was working my normal 1900 shift. I was dispatched to a Code 3 cardiac arrest for a side hanging at around 3 o'clock. The call info only had that the patient was a 34-year-old male hanging and the sheriff and PD were on scene. The location was in the more desolate farm properties in the valley. No street lights, just dark, cold, and engulfed in dense fog during the winter. Rolling up, I see a man dressed head to toe in black. Black shoes, black pants, black long sleeve shirt, black beanie, I mean everything. He was in handcuffs, sitting on his hands, with two officers surrounding him, a female, and two very young kids by the house's front door. There was a broken rope noose on the ground underneath this oddly large, wicked-looking gray skeleton of a tree. The man had a small laceration and a rope burn on his neck, but he was very much alive. When looking at him, his eyes had little of the white and were black. He was quiet until I sat him on the ambulance gurney. The man was sobbing, trembling, and screaming that he can't take it anymore. As I was putting on our leather restraints on his wrists, I noticed that he had deep, horizontal cutting scars along both of his wrists. He was only trembling now, as if he was scared. All I could feel was cold. This man was clearly struggling and decided that night he would give up and end it all, leaving his wife or girlfriend and two children behind. So far, just a sad story, right? Well, this is where it gets freaky. I have never seen anything like this or heard of an experience like this ever before. Three years later, it still gives me the chills every time I think about it. On the way to the hospital, a few good miles down the road, we made a wrong turn, got a little lost and took a back road. He was quiet and trembling. He wasn't fighting the restraints. He almost seemed to feel safer in the back of the ambulance. While I concluded assessing, I got this bone cold shiver down my spine. I looked out the window and saw this house. Mind you, there are acres between every single house out here. Well, this house was like the others. It looked normal but next to it was this big tree or bush, and in a separate tone and position was this old four-door sedan, parked. The car looked out of place and was clearly separated from the house and the tree and bush. It was like the car was its own place. It was really odd and creepy. I can normally see into the car's cab and see the headrest of the driver's seat from afar, but this car was pitch black on the inside, almost as if the darkness was coming out of the windows because it was the deepest and darkest black I've ever seen. All I saw inside was this deep black and two neon dark blue eyes staring back at me, a little above where a tall and very large man's eyes would be in a car. Immediately, I felt the back of the ambulance get colder, and there were goosebumps. 
on my skin. At first, I thought it was a security light or a reflection in the car. But as we passed the house, the car turned on, pulled out, and started following us in the ambulance. The neon blue eyes were still there, and the cab was still as dark as ever. The car followed us miles to the highway, still with those eyes staring, and the deepest, darkest black in the cab. Even with all the street lights, I could not see into the car. I was almost mystified by this and nearly forgot about my patient. All I knew was that I did not feel welcomed by these dark blue neon eyes. It was almost threatening and felt as if it wanted my patient. We were on the highway and this car was still following us, over 20 miles now. The neon dark eyes were still there and I still couldn't see into the car. It got colder. I started to feel as if it noticed to be watching and was watching and focusing on me now instead of my patient. The car then sped up and pulled up next to the ambulance in the next lane while we were driving and looked directly at me. I was very literally five feet from this car and I could see nothing through the windows. All I could see were those eyes but they weren't looking ahead. They were looking directly at me. In that moment, I said quietly, but out loud, go away. You are not touching this man. This man is my patient. And if you want him, you'll have to come through me. I'm stronger than you and I will not let you have him. After I said that, not even a moment later, the car and my ambulance split off as one went onto one off ramp and the other, I don't know where it went. It was no longer cold in the ambulance and my patient was no longer gray in the cheeks, but now his cheeks were pink and normal. It wasn't until after the call and when we got the patient inside the hospital when I realized what had just happened. I truly feel that Whatever those deep neon blue eyes belonged to was not human and that it wanted that man. I've never believed in the paranormal or demons or spirits or anything that wasn't hardcore science until this. I haven't had an encounter like that again and I hope I never do. I don't know if that man is still alive or what his outcome was, but all I know is what I experienced and saw that night and it was horrifying. Firstly, I will mention this didn't happen in an actual castle, but instead was an old Victorian hospital or workhouse the property still has the name castle in it. So I call it my castle story. So in South Wales, I want to say in around 2011, I can't quite remember as I would have been around 10 or 11 years old. This was a family holiday with my siblings and our family friends, which we call auntie and uncle, etc., because we're that close. It also involved all of the children who were around my age. In total, there were about 10 of us. I've never really been somebody to believe in the paranormal, but I would say that this is the only thing that would lean me toward it. The people who own the property are a couple, one of which is the sibling of a family friend we are staying with, and they are lovely. However, I cannot seem to get my head around how comfortable they are with this sort of thing. I also forgot to mention that this was a weekend surrounding Halloween time, which only intensifies the creepy aspect of this ordeal. On the first night, I was the only one out of the 10 of us who was actually terrified of the house itself. There was no central heating, no internet, as you can imagine in an old Victorian building. It was just creepy. As we sat at the table eating dinner, the owner, who lives in a lovely cottage right next to the building, came over to make sure we had everything we needed and to wish us a good night. She could tell that I was very distressed and tried to see what the matter was. 
I imagine she already had a very clear idea. I refused to tell her and began to get really emotional just from the fact that I was so scared. My mom explained that I was terrified and that my mind was probably just playing tricks on itself. Our host then went on to say, there's no one here that will hurt you. The next thing she said properly scared me and I can still remember the sense of dread that came over me despite being told it wasn't negative. She went on to say, the only other thing here is the little girl and she is ever so friendly. Can you imagine being that scared on Halloween weekend and then you're told that the place in which you're spending the next few nights has a ghost girl in it? After she told everyone this, I have to say the mood definitely changed. Even the adults were a bit like, hang on a second, what did she just say? The host reassured us that it was nothing to worry about and that her daughters used to speak to her through the walls all the time. I remember the other kids my age were a bit worried at this point, so their dad offered to take anyone who wanted upstairs to walk around and let them know that they were completely safe. It goes without saying that I was the only one who did not go. Over the next few hours, everyone relaxed by the fire and then all headed to bed. I remember the layout of the house like it's my own, despite being there for only two days almost 10 years ago. I had asked my mom to stay with me until I fell asleep, and then she would go stay in the end room with my sisters. They are marginally younger than me and, embarrassingly, were managing to sleep on their own just fine. My mom did so, and I fell asleep fine. I remember waking up and feeling at ease, but I wasn't ready for what came the next night. We had a day doing tourist things, and I remember that this was actually Halloween day. So when we came home, we got dressed and did the whole trick or treat thing around the surrounding village. I remember walking back to the house on the cold, dark Halloween night, up to the old bendy spooky road you take up to the house and being greeted by this black obelisk we were sleeping in. This night started like the one before. We got cozy by the fire, the adults had a drink, and then we headed to bed. I was woken up at around two in the morning when I heard the sound of scratching and tapping coming from the ceiling. It was one of those moments when you wake up suddenly and you try to get your bearings, but everything around you is just disorienting. This scratching was constant and horrific, so I plucked up enough courage to run down the narrow, dark hallway which stretched the whole length of the house to where my mom was sleeping. I got in the bed and tried to forget what I'd heard. When I woke up in the morning, it was pretty much eat breakfast and say goodbye and then leave as we had quite a long drive home. I remember driving back, I was told two things. It was like the good news and bad news cliche. My mom firstly told me the reason I was woken up and could hear scratching was because the roof was so old the ravens had made their way in and had started to nest. I remember this settled me. However, what came next truly still spooks me. My mom told me she had asked a family member back home to do some research on the building to see what the history was, but not to tell her until we left. She then went on to say that the castle is actually haunted by this little girl who would often run down the hallways. Of course, it's up to you if you believe in that sort of thing. But she went on to say that on both nights, she heard consistent running up the hall every few hours or so. She went on to say that she would often come to check on me to see if I had gotten up, but I was fast asleep. She was in the same room as my siblings, so it couldn't have been them. I have absolutely no explanation other than it could have been the birds, but I highly doubt it. I proceeded to quiz her and say, are you absolutely sure that it was footsteps? And although I was young, I remember her being very genuine. It was footsteps. This might seem like a mixture of an older spooky place and a frightened child's mind, but I can still remember all of it as clear as day. 
I was told the girl was probably looking to play with my siblings and I, and that's why she was running around. But it still freaks me out to this very day. My parents recently bought a farm last year in Australia and have been building a property on it for their retirement. It's right beside a national park and reasonably close to the next property over. The only thing that sucks is that we have no cell service besides the top paddock where they're building their house. Not too dodgy, right? Well, I'm a university student, 21 year old female in my second year of nursing and I frequently come up to the farm to help them out with their livestock and whatnot. At first, everything was fine. We had a small two bedroom cabin in the lower paddock that I stayed in every time I came up. My room had a large window that faced the national park and at night when it was pitch black, it would really freak me out a bit, but nothing serious. Sure, we had the usual noises of foxes and livestock at nighttime but nothing out of the ordinary. Things really ramped up when I had to stay there alone to feed the livestock for a few days while my parents were back in the city. I went about the usual chores, feeding the sheep, keeping an eye on our lambs and checking in at the building site to keep an eye on everything. I went into town to get some dinner at the local pub. And by the time I got home, it was roughly 10 PM. I would usually take my car up to the top paddock at night to call my friends, check social media and so on. My car was lit up by internal navigation systems, which meant that I couldn't really see outside the car besides whatever my headlights lit up. I was midway through my social media scrolling when I thought I saw something black flash across the paddocks where my headlights were facing. I drove my car in a quick circle to use my car's headlights as a massive torch, but I didn't see anything. No reflections of cattle's eyes like I normally do, or the usual fox or rabbit. There was nothing. I tried not to pay too much attention to it, and I went back to my social media scroll. Until I accidentally pressed my brakes, which allowed my brake lights to flood the paddock behind my car with an eerie red light. The same black flash that I had seen through my front windshield flickered out of the corner of my eye in the rear view mirror. Now I was suspicious. I turned off the music I'd been listening to and just sat for a second, trying to assure myself I was just tired. After a few seconds of silence, I was relieved and was about to turn my car on to go back to the cabin. And that's when I heard what I can only describe as claws on my rear windshield. Tap, tap, scratch. I have never sped as fast as I did back to the cabin that night. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling of something watching me from the forest. You know that sort of tingling sensation of something staring into the back of your head? After tossing and turning, I put up a newspaper in front of my window, the one that faces the woods until it was completely covered. The feeling immediately went away. Still, it's safe to say that sleep did not come easily. The following night, I chose to go to the top paddock while it was still reasonably light. All was pretty peaceful and I had all but forgotten about the previous night's events. I was admiring the gorgeous pink sunset when I saw a flash of green in the sky travel for a split second and then disappear. Now listen, I'm not one for UFOs, but I know it wasn't a helicopter because it was light enough to see the sky and the stars weren't even out yet. I thought it was cool, so I called one of my friends who's a massive skeptic about everything paranormal. Of course, she thought I was nuts and proceeded to give me crap for it. It started to get a bit dark for my liking, so I went back to the cabin and cooked some dinner. All was fine until I went to sleep, the newspaper from the night before still clinging to my window. 
I woke up at around 2 a.m. to a sound. I went to take a look on foot with my spotlight. Now, usually, when you bring a very bright light and irritate the sheep, who were already going nuts, you hear about it. Keyword being, usually. I walked over to the paddock and started scanning with my spotlight, and I didn't see anything. The sheep were bleating like crazy, but none were injured or even remotely in a corner of the paddock, huddled together like they usually do when there's a fox or a predator. That was until they all went silent. One second they were so loud that they echoed around the hills, and the next, it was dead silent. Now I was truly scared. I raised my rifle and started looking around, feeling like everything around me had its eyes on me. It was then that I heard a thump of something heavy being dropped on the ground heavy enough for me to feel the vibration in my feet. I booked it back to the cabin and locked everything behind me. I was pacing around, double checking the doors and windows when I heard it. It sounded like humming, but it was distorted and there were footsteps with it. These footsteps were not human though. It's like something was limping and then quickly recovering. Step. Step, 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 around the cabin and stopping at my bedroom window. I curled to the ground, gripping my rifle until my fingers were frozen in place. And that's how I fell asleep that night. I left first thing in the morning without even looking to see if there were footprints or anything else. If anyone has any clue what's going on or what this thing is and can tell me what I can do, let me know, because I haven't been able to go back to my parents' farm ever since. If you're from Northeast Ohio, you've definitely heard about Squire's Castle in Willoughby. And like many other places in Willoughby, Squires is said to be haunted. My whole life, I've said this is bogus. In fact, the ghost stories that I heard of it felt practically impossible. It's said that at night, through the windows, you can see the lantern light of the owner's wife who died there. This can't be true, because she didn't die there. But I don't know, whatever, I guess. Still, everything I believed about this place changed when some friends and I went ghost hunting the other night. We went in so excited. We had planned to walk up to the castle, look through, and maybe even explore the hiking trails afterwards, all late at night. It was drizzling, not very much, no big storms or anything at the time that we were out there. At right about midnight, driving towards Squires, maybe about a mile away, the three of us in the car saw a bright light in the sky, somewhat above where the castle was. One of us initially thought it was lightning, but it definitely wasn't. It was bright, produced no sound, and lasted just a couple of seconds. It happened twice, lighting up a circle of clouds in a white, bluish-purple light. We didn't think too much of it at the time, but now it feels like it should be included in the story. Then at about 12.05, we pulled up to Squire's Castle. From the road, before even pulling into a parking spot, we could see it, the lantern. There was an orange glow coming from inside the castle and it was moving. Initially, I thought it was a house behind the castle. Then I remembered nothing was behind the castle except dense trees. It couldn't have been my headlights because they weren't even pointing that way and we weren't moving. One of my friends thought it was just some teens exploring the castle like we had planned to do. But as we pulled into the parking spaces, we saw that there were no other cars and that the light had disappeared. After gathering enough courage, we left the car and started toward the castle. I was recording on a handheld camera one friend was recording video on his phone, 
and my other friend was recording audio on her phone. We walked all the way up until we could see the castle. I personally didn't see much, but my friends saw quite a bit. Watching his phone, my friend said things like, I saw something flash by on my camera, or there's something moving around inside. My other friend felt a little gross. If you've had the same kind of encounter, I'm sure you'll know what she means. She also said that she saw things moving inside, that she was looking with just her eyes and no camera. My friend said she really wanted to go into the building, but my other friend and I wanted to get out of there, me especially. So we turned back toward the car and walked back. On the way back, we were still kind of exploring, thinking that maybe we could see things on the side of the path, but we weren't sure. Then my friend half jokingly said, I low key want to go back up and into the castle. Shortly after she said this, boom, a heavy stomp could be heard right next to my friend. Nope, she said and ran. The two of us ran after her. My friend said that they heard the stomp and could feel the presence of something right next to them. We got in the car and drove off so fast. All of us were in shock. I was holding back tears. I didn't know what to feel. I had never experienced anything like that before. On our 20 minute drive home, we decided to examine our evidence. First up was the audio recording. We listened back to it and my friend stopped it shortly after it started. She was like, what? Why is it like that? That's so weird. The audio recording started as normal. We leave the car and then we're heading back to the car. The part of the recording where we walked up to the castle and all that was completely missing. We've never had any issues with her phone before. In fact, we've used that exact phone to catch the voices of multiple entities in the past. Then we moved on to the phone video. You can see lots of misty drizzle moving past the camera, and sometimes you can see my friend's breath. It was surprisingly cold for being 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit the whole day. But when we're up at the castle, the video gets a little spooky. We paused the video on the flashes that he saw earlier and saw single frames of shapes running past. These things were differently shaped and colored than the misty water droplets. These were the most terrifying things that we got from the trip, in my opinion. We also got one picture that was kind of clear and whatever it was, wasn't really too human shaped. Also, we could very faintly see shapes of people or reflections of eyes inside the windows. Then on the way back from the castle, we didn't see anything in the video. Recently, I examined my video on a computer. Now, typically people save the best for last, but my video was not the best. I saw very little within it as it was very dark, but on our way up, we could see a couple of orbs and on the way back, we could see small points that kind of looked like sets of eyes peering and blinking. Looking back on the experience, we are kind of filled with dread. My friend is very spiritually active and knowledgeable and feels that we could have been in some serious danger. She says she's definitely adding this to her list when she's felt unsafe from the presence of some kind of entity. I guess we might never know what exactly we experienced that night, but we'll never forget it.